everyone, and welcome. I'd like to call this Monday, February 28th, 2022, meeting of the Bloomington City Council to order. Thanks to everyone for joining us. We'll start our meeting as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. If you could, please stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, good evening. Thank you for joining us. We will start with our roll call of the council. Mr. Brillard, if you could, please. Carter. Present. Coulter. Present. D'Alessandro. Present. Martin. Present. Nelson. Here. Mayor Bussey. Here. It looks like Councilmember Lohman has not joined us yet. Councilmember Lohman must be running a couple of minutes late, so we will... Make note of it when he does arrive. We now have six of the seven city council members present this evening, and four of us here in the chambers. And if you're watching at home or if you're here in person, uh, you'll notice that uh, we have a, a mix here of masks and no masks, where we are with our the, the data that we've been receiving from Hennepin County. The city of Bloomington has relaxed the mask mandate within city facilities. And so the, the sign on the door, I think, said, Masks, welcome, but not required, and I think that's where we are right now. So we'll hear a little bit more about that uh, in not too long when Dr. Nick Keller gives us an update on COVID-19. But if you are tuning in and wondering what the deal is, that's what the deal is right now. So that's where we are with our, our mask requirements here in city facilities. Next up on our agenda is the approval of tonight's agenda. Uh, if you've reviewed tonight's agenda, we're kind of uh, front-loaded here. We've got a number of introductory items, a lot of presentations that we'll be going through, so that should take some time. We've got a sizable consent business that I'm sure we'll be able to get through in a reasonable amount of time. We actually, under hearings, resolutions, and ordinances, we have one public hearing, and that is for the redevelopment at 8200 Humboldt Avenue. And we'll be looking at the comprehensive plan map amendment to rezone and then do the uh, preliminary and final development plans. So that'll be our only public hearing for this evening. Under organizational business, we have a couple of items of interest, the 494 project, the visual quality process update, and an update on earned sick and safe leave. We won't be taking a vote on anything regarding sick and safe leave tonight, just an update from staff on this to where we are. So staff, is there, are there any questions or additions or subtractions to tonight's agenda? Hearing none, I would move approval of tonight's agenda. Second. We've got a motion and a second by Council Member Carter to adopt tonight's agenda. Hearing no further council discussion, Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 6-0. We have an agenda and we'll move on. Next up on our agenda is item four, our public comment period. It's a 20-minute period at the beginning of each of our council meetings where we allow residents to come forward and address the council not on tonight's agenda. And uh, we start with uh, item 4.1, which is a response to the prior meeting's public comments. And I know we had a couple of... Uh, uh, folks who asked for specific responses or asked specific questions last time. And so I will uh, welcome our city manager, Jamie Verbrugge, and ask him to respond to item 4.1. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. Good evening. Uh, a couple of responses following up on the meeting of February 14th. Uh, first from uh, resident uh, Angela Coyle. I don't know that she had a specific uh, question of staff or the council, but I did want to follow up on some comments that she made related to the city's efforts around uh, racial equity. And I think the suggestion was that the city was uh, somehow out of step and, and uh, doing things that didn't need to be done, uh, especially in the work around equity. I'd, I'd like to remind for uh, the council and, and for the community that the city has been uh, making efforts to focus on equity going back to 2015 when the city participated in something called the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. That was a project that was sponsored by the League of Minnesota Cities, and it included a number of other cities from around the state uh, that were interested in advancing the work of equity in their organizations and in their community. And uh, I think it goes beyond just the state of Minnesota. The National League of Cities has had an emphasis on equity uh, in the policies that they are looking at and advocating for. And uh, I thought it was timely that I received the uh, monthly publication from uh, an organization called the International City County Management Association, 
This magazine is called Public Management. ICMA uh, rec, uh, or uh, ICMA uh, has over 11,000 members who are local government professionals, leading cities and counties, and and other local government uh, uh, professionals. And on the cover of their uh, monthly publication, it says, "Sorry, if I can line this up for you." Elevating your equity work. This is the cover story for ICMA's public management magazine. And it goes on to talk about the profession's commitment to equity and justice and questioning whether that commitment is actually strong enough and talking about how the ICMA Committee on Professional Conduct is taking the lead on a comprehensive review of our code of ethics through the lens of racial justice and equity. Now, I point all of this out because I think it's important uh, to state that the work that the city of Bloomington is doing right now on racial equity is not by any means uh, out of the mainstream of what other cities are doing. Cities uh, in Minnesota and around the country recognize that equity is an important consideration in the work that we do to improve our communities. And I think it is important work that we're continuing to do here in Bloomington. I wanted to make sure that we spent some time talking about that, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. And then uh, Mr. Andy Thule had some questions for the Council. Uh, one of them had to do with our strategic planning process and the group that, the consultant group that we are working with, Transformation Systems, and the principal, Teresa Arpin. Uh, Mr. Thule asked, how long in years and months has the city manager worked with uh, Teresa and Transformation Systems? We retained the services uh, formally of Transformation Systems uh, late last summer, early fall, uh, prior to commencing the community cafe process for our Bloomington Tomorrow Together process. Uh, and um, that's, the, that's the formal arrangement that we've had with Transformation Systems uh, as a consultant to the city. Prior to that, I did work with Transformation Systems in the city that I managed prior to coming to Bloomington in Brooklyn Park. That work started in the in the uh, fall of 2009. Uh, similar process using community cafes and a core planning team, uh, action teams and measurement teams, very similar process. And uh, after that engagement, uh, there was a meeting once a year as a check-in meeting. So uh, the total number of hours uh, that were worked over the, you know, the five years or so that we were engaged with them was about uh, 80 hours total. Uh, so the question that Mr. Thule asked about how much we're paying transformation systems uh, for their participation as a consultant in this process, we have a contract with them. It's a not to exceed contract of $55,000, um, which uh, is, I think, a very reasonable consultant expense for the amount of time and effort and the, the leadership that they are providing in this process. Um, there was a question about total compensation and dollars for city staff who are involved in this. And I think it's important to note that uh, the strategic planning initiative is part and parcel of city staff's duties and responsibilities. It's not something that's in addition to their assignments. Uh, staff are compensated for their overall work of the city. It's not parsed out based on what the assignments are that they're given. Uh, and I should also note that many of the staff who are working on this are classified as exempt employees. So they don't qualify for overtime compensation. Uh, I can tell you we haven't tallied the amount of overtime because we aren't all the way through the process. Uh, we had a number of city staff that participated in the core planning process or uh, the core planning team back in December. And that's where uh, most of the overtime was um, uh, incurred. And so we can go back and take a look at that at the end of the process. Um, there was a question about the ratio of city staff to residents on each team. Mr. Thule suggested that uh, this process is heavily weighted by, by um, city staff people as opposed to residents. Our core planning team, uh, 29 members, 11 of them are city staff. So that's 62% are community members. That's 18 uh, people. On our action teams, uh, 39 members total, 61% of them are community. City staff, 16, uh, community members, 24. The measurement team, 19 members total, 73% of them are members of the community. There are five city staff on the measurement team and 14 community members that are participating in that process, which I think is evidence that this is a community-based process. As a matter of fact, the consultant's recommendation was that uh, this process should be 50-50 with residents and staff. 
And you can see in the construct of our measurement team and our action teams uh, that we are actually exceeding that uh, in favor of community participation. Uh, how many staff are being added to fulfill the strategic goals into 2030? And, and frankly, that's a question that doesn't have an answer because this process has not been finalized. It hasn't been presented to the city council. Uh, specific initiatives haven't been identified to carry out the plan. So all of that uh, discussion is yet to come uh, this year and in future years. So that's a question that doesn't have an answer. Uh, Mr. Thule also asked about whether the city was going to continue to use the word chief in our job description, such as fire chief or police chief, uh, and uh, recognize that there are some places where they have stopped using that word uh, because of concerns uh, and sensitivities to the Native American community. Uh, he indicated that his own workplace does not uh, use that word in their job descriptions anymore, and he asked if the city was going to no longer do that. Uh, and uh, he was frustrated he hadn't see, received a response. Uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Thule is correct. I actually was negligent in, in providing timely response. I talked to our racial equity coordinator about this uh, over a month ago. And so uh, as council's aware, I was gone for a couple of weeks and I did not get an answer to Mr. Thule before I left. So that that's on me. But here's, here's the information that uh, that faith provided, and I think it's really good direction. Uh, first, as always, in addressing um, issues of offense, it's important to center those conversations uh, with those who are most directly impacted. And so faith reached out to people in her network who identify as indigenous or as Native American. And what she learned from them is that calling a Native American person a chief as a form of salutation is offensive. Using the word chief in connection with a graphic or logo demeaning Native American culture is also offensive. Okay? Um, however, the, the context of the word uh, becomes a little bit more nuanced depending on the situation. Uh, there have been examples of uh, cities that are looking at this. The most recent one that we were familiar with was in Duluth in 2020 when uh, there was discussion about removing chief from employee titles. My understanding is they did not actually follow through on that. Uh, but that's the only that's the only city organization that I'm aware of that has done that. Um, and I think the the bottom line of this conversation is if there is an interest in uh, reviewing that situation or that issue to see if we might want to consider renaming our job titles, um, then what we want to do is reach out to members of our indigenous and Native American community. Um, before deciding if it is offensive and determining what that means for our organization. Interestingly, I would note that Mr. Thule did not suggest that he is in favor of that. He simply asked why we were not doing it. And so I'm curious to know if Mr. Thule favors us doing that. And if he is uh, in favor of it, I think he should recommend to the council that, that we look into that. Um, because frankly, an idea like that should come from the, uh, from the community and uh, you know, we can we can act on it after that. So those are the responses that I have, Mr. Mayor, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions from uh, you or the council. Thank you, Mr. Berugi. Council, any questions? Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I guess I just wanted to provide a little more clarity to, as you talked about the city staff to resident ratio and the fact that this is a community-based strategic planning process, I think it's important for people to realize that the city of Bloomington is an organization it is an institution, and so this is a strategic plan to drive our actions, and we're doing it in a way that is driven by the community through this community-based strategic planning process. But the work is still gonna have to be led by, resourced by the city itself. And so it's really important to have city staff engaged in those conversations so that <clears throat> they can bring that lens of, you know, what's already happening, what kind of resources and supports are already there, what would maybe be needed in the future. And I'm sure you could elaborate on this um, point even more, Jamie, but <clears throat> I think that that's just a really important point to make that this isn't necessarily a strategic plan that is supposed to be community led and for the community. It really is a city strategic plan that is community based with community input. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Carter. I think that's an excellent uh, clarification and, 
and additional context, and, and you're absolutely right. Council, additional questions? I do not see any hands up. So with that, we will move on to item 4.2 on our agenda, which is the public comment period itself. As I said earlier, it's a five-minute period at each, or excuse me, a 20-minute period at each city council meeting where we hear from residents and concerned citizens on items not on tonight's agenda. We do limit folks to five minutes each, so everyone has an opportunity to speak. And we do set this up so it's not a back and forth between the council and anyone who's speaking. It's an opportunity for the council to listen to the, to the community uh, on items that uh, affect the council, affect the city in general. And uh, if necessary and if appropriate, we'll respond at the next meeting, which uh, you just saw and just heard uh, Mr. Verbrugge do on item 4.1. So under item 4.2, I know we had at least one person who called ahead of time and said she would like to speak. Uh, Jerome, do we have Ms. Sally Ness on the phone to speak to item 4.2? Yes, we have Sally on the line. And Sally, your line is now open. Thank you. Good evening, Sally. Hello. Good Thank evening, you. Ms. Ness. Welcome. Last week I spoke... Oh. This, this is Sally Ness. Okay. Last week, I spoke about concerns with city responses to a 1701 American Boulevard conditional use permit and questions asked but unanswered. Tonight, more concerns with city responses. A resident wrote to the city manager and attached the Martin Luther King Jr. quote, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. The city manager responded, I also want to add a comment regarding the image you attached, quoting the Reverend King. As I understand your use of the image, it is to convey a message of colorblindness. I think it is important to note that is not the context in which Dr. King made that comment. He was speaking directly to anti-racism. Colorblindness and anti-racism are not even remotely the same thing. If I have misinterpreted your understanding of the image, please accept my apology. If I have accurately understood your motivation, I would ask that you please stop using it in that regard because it is disingenuous and disrespectful of King's message and legacy. I do not agree with a city manager informing a resident what they can not include in an email. Whether Dr. King was speaking about colorblindness, anti-racism, both or something else. Another resident wrote to the mayor concerned with his response to someone's previous public comment, and the mayor writes in an email to the city manager how mega of him. A resident called the police about a rooster in the Smith Park neighborhood. That data indicates no case number and that homeowner was advised to keep the rooster under control and to ensure they are contained and that they remain quiet in the early morning hours. From the city website, no person shall keep roosters or adult male chickens on any property within the city. A resident called the police about tents in a bouncy house at Smith Park and wanted them checked for permits. The police response, it is a church that is celebrating their 10-year anniversary. Permits were applied for and granted by the city of Bloomington. I informed them to continue the celebration. The facility sales receipt for a use from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. with a charge of $43.01 indicates no inflatables. Concerning tents, it first states no, then handwritten yes. The permit application is for a canopy and a B house and states denied with notes stating does not meet code standards, wrong material and uses ground stakes. Two things. One, the reason for the use is not a factor. Whether the tent canopy and bouncy house were allowed is. The facility sales receipt indicates the bouncy house was not. Additionally, there's no staff to confirm whether the tent and canopy met code standards. Two, unlike Moria Park with 218 acres is staffed. Smith Park is not and is only about 25 acres. Additionally, the area by the gazebo surrounded by a hill, a pond, and a large gym is only about an acre. Burglary near 82nd and Park. Same area man was attacked two months earlier where young men were captured on video while at the park. And political and faith leaders call for religious tolerance and unity regardless that the attack was not about intolerance. Homeowner was told homeowner was told their house was likely surveilled by the burglar and there is no data to indicate video of the park was requested the attacked man was attending the building after 10 p.m which was not proposed use and therefore the city never addressed the negative impact to the neighborhood such as surveilling of homes a couple months later a homeowner is negatively impacted when home is burglarized and still the city has not addressed the negative use of the building after 10 p.m additionally the report states the card was used at various locations including target and walmart Unfortunately, the request to export, export the video from Target came three days late, and the burglar 
unlike the two who assaulted the man, were not caught. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ness. Jerome, do we have anyone else on the line who wishes to speak to item 4.2, our public comment period? Number dial in, Dr. Mack. Thank you. Do we have anyone here in the council chambers who wishes to speak to item 4.2? Our public comment period? Jerome, if you could make one more check. Is there anyone on the line who wishes to speak to item 4.2? No, nah, no more dialed in as of now. All right, we have no one on the line, no one coming forward. So with that, Council, I will close item 4.2, our public comment period for tonight. And we will move on to item 5 on our agenda, our introductory items. And item 5.1 uh, is a presentation for our... Uh, uh, our Bloomington Pioneers and Changemakers and a recognition during Black History Month. And I'm going to come down to the, uh, the podium here in just a moment because I know folks are going to be coming in. At least I hope they are because it's going to be a short presentation if they're not here. So. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for being with us tonight. It's greatly appreciated. It is with uh, the greatest pleasure that I stand here tonight to recognize some fantastic leaders in the Bloomington community, our 2022 Bloomington Pioneers and Changemakers honorees. The Bloomington Pioneers and Changemakers Profile Series, which is a series that we do through our communications department, features black leaders who have a significant impact on and connection to the city of Bloomington. As you all probably know, February is, of course, Black History Month, and it's a fitting time to recognize the impact that these folks have made throughout our community throughout the years. The people featured in this series have worked to advance civil rights and to remove barriers to equity in the fields of faith, education, law, housing, government, and more. In this annual series that the city does, uh, the city honors pioneers who have done so much to chart the path to where we are today and for change makers who are paving the way for future generations. And this year we recognize seven incredible individuals. Blaine Kelly, Marvis Kilgore, Pat Longs, Inja Lawrence Porter, Derek Rhodes, Patricia Riley, and Luis Versalis. Now, I'm going to read a paragraph introducing you all, explaining to the folks in the community uh, who you are and, and the outstanding impact you've had. As I'm reading, if you could stand up and just wave to everybody so everybody can recognize you. And then Grant, back in the control room, is going to find you with the camera to make sure that we get a good picture of you so we, uh, we know exactly who you are. So if you could remain standing while I'm reading, and then we'll sit down. And then when I'm done with everybody, we will come up for a presentation of, uh, of certificates and for a formal grip and grin for all of the photographers here this evening. So if we could do that. We will start with Blaine Kelly. There is Blaine. Blaine, a uh, Bloomington native, is a case manager for Oasis for Youth, and he is a trusted resource committed to elevating and empowering youth in our local community. Blaine is an advocate, community leader, and a champion for equity. Thanks for being here tonight. <laughs> Have a seat. And Marvis Kilgore. Marvis? Marvis is the coordinator of the new Black Men in Teaching program at Normandale Community College. Marvis plays an essential role in developing this critically important program, which will offer academic, career, and personal support to black men starting their higher education journeys to become licensed K-12 teachers. Welcome. Good evening. 
Pat Longs. Pat is not with us this evening. Is a resident and Bloomington Leadership Academy alum. Is a case manager at Catholic Charities and serves on Homeline Board of Directors. Pat is a zealous advocate who is fully committed to assisting families in finding stable shelter and housing. Let's give Pat a round of applause. And Gia Lawrence Porter holds a master's degree in African American Studies from Cornell University and has held several influential roles in higher education throughout Minnesota. Currently, Gia is a, an academic advisor at Normandale Community College and has been a powerhouse as a social justice and racial equity seeker. seeker. She's also the Normandale College Black Student Alliance advisor. Her peers and students describe her as someone who doesn't hesitate to lead when leadership is needed to push for a more equitable environment for the success of students. <laughs> Derek Rhodes, did Derek make it? I know he was coming from another meeting, apparently he might not have made it and, and that is too bad. Derek is a true Bloomington hero. He recently retired from the Bloomington Fire Department after 20 years of service. Derek served at stations one and five as firefighter, captain, and chief. Derek is recognized as the first African-American to retire from the Bloomington Fire Department. Let's <laughs> Patricia Riley. Good evening, Patricia, welcome. Patricia Riley is a Bloomington resident and community activate, act, advocate nominated by the Bloomington Public School staff for supporting students and staff at Kennedy High School and throughout the BPS community. Patricia is praised for providing youth with support, encouragement, and room to grow. Welcome, thank you. And wrapping it up, we have Luis Versalis. Luis is a second generation Afro-Cuban American, born and raised in Bloomington. Formerly a Spanish and English teacher with Bloomington Public Schools, Luis is now the Executive Director of Education for Pacific Education Group, leading a team of transformational equity specialists who guide organizational change. Luis, welcome. We are so happy to have all of these folks with us here tonight. And right now I'd like to call up uh, Blaine, Marvis, and Gia, Patricia, and Luis. Uh, did, did, I didn't miss anybody else today on my list here. I think please come forward. We would like to, uh, as I said, get a, a grip and grin opportunity and make sure that Faith can offer you and give you the uh, certificates of appreciation. So how would you like us to do this? As the group or one at a time? How about that? Okay. <laughs> Why don't everybody shift that direction just a little bit? Family members, do not be shy. We... <laughs> Shyness doesn't work in the council chambers here. Come on forward if you want a good picture, please. If we could, let's uh, give them 
a round of applause for their work making such a community such a more inclusive and equitable place. Thank you so much. Well done. Thank you all so very much. And now you're headed down to the Black Box Theater, I believe. Yeah, you can just follow me on that. <laughs> Enjoy the reception. Thanks for being here tonight. And before we uh, move on, I just want to take a minute to, to recognize our outstanding award-winning communications staff and those folks who worked tirelessly to make this profile series such a, a, an annual success. I want to acknowledge the work of uh, Emily Taplin and Ashley Clemmer specifically. They coordinate the Bloomington Pioneers and Changemaker program, and they collect and share the stories of our outstanding honorees. Our communications division just consistently and remarkably continues to find ways to use its talents and its platform to demonstrate the city's commitment to equity and inclusion, and this project obviously reflects that commitment. So on behalf of myself and the council, Emily, Ashley, thank you so very much for the work you do. Outstanding. Thank you very, very much. And finally, if you haven't already, uh, be sure to check out the city's YouTube channel and our webpage where you can see the profiles and keep on a lookout for future videos and briefing articles that we'll have on this, uh, this outstanding series. So that it was, I'm glad we were able to do that in person. It was nice that we were able to get everybody here and be able to do that in person. Moving on to item 5.2 on our agenda, our update on COVID-19 and Dr. Nick Kelly joining us once again for an update. Dr. Kelly, good evening. Good, good to evening. see you. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. I have a few slides to kind of show tonight about some of the impact we've seen and give you an update of where we are and how things are going. I'm here tonight to provide you with a summary of current conditions and share my thoughts of how we live with COVID going forward. We're in a very, very different place than we were the last time I was here. On January 10th, the seventh day. Whoop. There we go. So on the next slide, we'll see the, the seventh day rolling average we saw in Bloomington uh, peaked on January 10th. That's over 2,300 cases per 100,000, the highest we've seen this entire pandemic. We saw 501 of our neighbors test positive on January 5th. And for context, the prior surge you see in December of 2020 was 777 cases per 100,000. If you go to the next slide, it'll show you the impact we saw by age groups. You can see this impacted everybody in Bloomington, regardless of age. And if you go to the next one, it'll remind us that this did not impact people equally. You see this is uh, cases by race and ethnicity, and we can see clearly that some members of our community uh, were impacted much more significantly, especially in our Hispanic, our black, and our Asian communities we saw far more cases than we would have expected if things were equal. If you go to the next one, this highlights probably the biggest impact that we saw. In the month of uh, December and January, we're unlike anything we saw. And this shows you we saw 133 individuals hospitalized in Bloomington in the month of January, the highest we've seen this entire pandemic. We've also saw the highest hospitalization rate in people under the age of 18. And the next slide will show, thankfully, we have not seen um, the change in death that uh, we have seen in previous waves. Uh, but the number of deaths we saw uh, in the last month were higher than any time we saw in 2021. So those are the slides. And I have a little bit more to kind of provide more context about where we're at. So the good news is at this point on February 28th, our metrics are similar to what we saw in early January of 2021. We've seen a steep drop in cases and test positivity rates in the community, and I anticipate they'll continue a downward trend in cases. We can't predict how low it will go, but we do expect cases to continue to drop. In Bloomington, 83% of individuals five years of age or older are fully vaccinated. 
and 88% have had at least one shot. That's phenomenal. It's something we should be really, really proud of. Our 5 to 11-year-old age group has the lowest vaccine coverage at 48%. The Hispanic and Asian non-Hispanic vaccine coverage is greater than the white non-Hispanic vaccine coverage in our community at 76%. We continue to work on increasing vaccine coverage in our black non-Hispanic community, which is at 62% fully vaccinated. As we move forward, Bloomington Public Health goals remain, responding to the pandemic remain the same reduce the number of infections in the community to maintain healthcare capacity and prevent or reduce the number of severe illness, hospitalizations, deaths, and individuals with long COVID. All the work to achieve these goals is done through a racial and health equity lens to address the disparate impacts of COVID-19 on specific groups within the community. A public health workforce development grant we received from the CDC through the Minnesota Department of Health is helping us do this. We've hired temporary staff to help us achieve uh, some of our vaccine goals. Many mitigations such as vaccination, ventilation, filtration, and staying home when sick and following quarantine guidance are gonna continue. These are the bedrocks of mitigations that we have for infectious diseases that we uh, get infected with by breathing air. Vaccination remains the most important tool we have because it reduces your risk of getting sick and dramatically reduces your risk of being hospitalized or dying. Other mitigations such as masking, testing, and social distancing may be modified as conditions change. On Friday, the CDC updated their COVID-19 community recommendations. The new tool classifies every county in the, in the country into low, medium, or high categories. Wearing a mask is recommended for everyone at high levels. At medium levels, where Hennepin County currently is, people at high risk for severe illness, which is about 45% of the population, are encouraged to talk with their doctor about masking and other precautions. People may choose to mask at any time. People with symptoms, a positive test, or exposure to someone with COVID-19 should mask. The guidance also asks health departments to consider health equity and make use of other surveillance information, such as wastewater or emergency department data, to inform local decision making. <clears throat> this change moves from a prevention approach to one that manages the impacts of disease on society. Our team's concerned about the impact of dropping certain metrics on our ability to understand the continued disparate impact of COVID on individuals in our community. We're specifically individuals in our BIPOC community, people with disabilities, people experiencing homelessness, and others. We're working with our colleagues at MDH to try and find ways to deal with this reality. We're also committed to providing data broken down by age, race, ethnicity to assist with local decision making. We expect metrics to continue to change as our understanding and information around COVID does too. Our team's preparing for this reality. In 1988, the Institute of Medicine published a report on the future of public health. And they defined that what public health is, is what we as society do collectively to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. COVID-19 is not impacting our community equally. We have community members with immune compromising conditions, those with underlying health conditions, and those that are not old enough to be vaccinated against COVID-19. These individuals may be struggling to manage COVID-19 risks and thus be more cautious. We each have different risk tolerances. What is acceptable for one may not be acceptable for another. We must not forget that some of our neighbors are now facing the reality of long COVID. The Mayo Clinic estimates 2.2 million Americans are no longer in the workforce because of long COVID. We also know the pandemic has disproportionately impacted the black, indigenous, and people of color communities in Bloomington. Our next steps in recovery process need to center the experience on the impact of the disease in these populations. In summary, it's okay to feel good about where we're at today with declining cases. At the same time, we wanna make sure people have protective layers of mitigation as needed. As we enter a new phase of our response, we expect there to be future dips and crests with COVID. Our tools remain the same. Vaccination, testing, high filtration masks, treatments such as antiviral medications, we're getting better at when and how to use these mitigations. As we enter this quieter period, do so with grace and humility, remembering our neighbors may not be in the same place as you. We've done a great job of being kind and caring to each other during this pandemic. Let's continue to be kind and caring during this next phase. And I just wanted to, to thank all of you for all the incredible help and guidance you've provided 
and support uh, you've shown our staff. Um, it's been uh, a privilege to be able to do this work under your leadership. Well, thank you, Dr. Kelly. I think that's very kind of you to say, but I think I think we were also smart enough to turn it over to leaders like you and your staff to to get the work done. And you did a, an outstanding job under what I know were incredibly trying circumstances. So my hat's off to you, to your entire staff, to all our public health professionals for the work that has been done over the past two years. And it's hard to believe that it's been two years that we've been doing this. Uh, almost we, within a couple of weeks, it will be two years to the day that we've been involved in this. And um, so my hat's off to you. Thank you. And I uh, appreciate your words and I appreciate your advice about approaching the future here with, uh, with humility and, and grace because, yes, we're, not everyone has come through this in the same way and some people have suffered some tremendous loss and um, that we, we have to keep that in mind as well uh, while, we, while we try and go back to living our lives the best way that we can and, and acknowledging that they're doing the same. So but thank you very much. Council, any questions of Dr. Kelly? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Dr. Kelly, I have a kind of a, I don't know if you can answer this tonight or not, but I've been kind of curious about um, when we think about the uh, flu and we talk about uh, kind of living with the flu, right, seasonally every year. Um, you know, we know that 30,000 or so uh, United States uh, residents die of flu over the course of the every year, give or take a little. You know, are we are we seeing number one are the disparities that we see with COVID similar in in the in the flu population? If you look at the data over the last you know decades or so, meaning the same you know frontline workers or other folks who've been overly exposed to the disease, do they tend to have the same challenges? And and the second question I would have is then you know when we think about what. Bloomington's response should be to COVID as it gets added to the list of these kind of seasonal, you know, um, viruses and other things that we've got vaccinations for, you know, what, what would you recommend our approach be? Um, do we need to change that? Do we need to do the same things we do with flu? You know, I'm, I'm trying to think about what the next five to 10 years looks like as this thing kind of becomes part and parcel of reality. Dr. Kelly. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilmember D'Alessandro. The, the challenge is, uh, so as you noted, we, we see a range, uh, somewhere between 7,000 and 40,000 Americans die every year from influenza. We've not seen that for the last two years. What we've seen is uh, over 950,000 Americans die from COVID. The, the impact of COVID, um, is really hard to compare to influenza because it's so much greater uh, than what we see. Uh, it's greater in terms of the scope of the clinical presentation and, and the long-term impact. We don't see some of those things with, with seasonal flu in part because it's a defined period of time and the population that it mostly impacts uh, from, a, 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 if you look purely at deaths tends to be uh, a very a targeted population of older adults um, that uh, are typically more frail. We don't see that with COVID. Uh, we see it impacting wide segments of the community. Uh, that's gonna be one of the challenges is vaccination makes it become uh, closer to flu in terms of the impact, uh, but we don't see some of the long-term complications or, or multi-system organ failure issues we see with flu or with COVID with flu. How we move forward, um, I really think it's going to be a lot of reflective conversations and understanding uh, the way we manage diseases that are spread through an airborne in the air we breathe is probably going to result in some changes to the way we, we think about structures, processes for, for air cleaning and the way we work. Those things are going to take time to work through and process. Um, I do hope that at some point we have a conversation from a societal standpoint about what risks we're, we're willing to take. You can't go back in history and look at, at some point in the US, we said, we're okay with an average of 30,000 people dying from flu. It just became part of the norm. We're seeing 2,000 plus a day die from COVID. So we, we can't really do that right now. Um, I think as the law continues, um, we can get there with more of those conversations. 
that's a lot of the recovery work that the state and the federal government are having a lot of conversations on of, of how do we move forward? What have we learned? How do we move these things differently? And no, we, we don't normally see the same frontline worker impact. Um, people will get sick with flu. We'll see 10 to 20% of the population in a bad flu year get sick. Uh, we think we saw uh, well over 40% of the country get sick in the last two months. Um, so they're, they're easy to, to look at, but really hard to compare from a metrics and impact standpoint. Yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Kelly. I, I agree with you. It's hard to go back to say like 1918 flu versus 2020 COVID and have those data points because we don't really have them. Um, my, my comment was more like as we get to a, some baseline of, of I don't want to call it stability. I don't know if that'll ever happen, right? But um, I appreciate that. I just want to thank you for that. And, and I think I don't want to speak for everybody else here, but I certainly think that this shouldn't be the last time we hear from you either because those some of those kind of um, reflective conversations we should have here in this public forum, in my opinion. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. Council, additional questions of Dr. Kelly? Don't see any. Uh, a couple of things I want to make note. Uh, looks like Councilmember Loman has defeated the Gremlins and is here with us now. So welcome, Councilmember Loman. Well done. I did want to ask uh, Mr. Verbrugge, given what we just heard from Dr. Kelly and, and the realities that we're facing now, what does that mean regarding uh, public meetings here with the City of Bloomington? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, we are going to uh, move back to in-person meetings starting the week of March 14th. Uh, need a couple of weeks to get things back in uh, shape to do that, and uh, believe that that is, is the right time to do it from both the uh, process and a, and a safety perspective. So, um, I I wouldn't be surprised to see most of the council members back next week. I'll be back next week, uh, and then for all of our boards and commissions, those will all be back in person starting the week of the fourteenth. We'll also, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council members, just have further discussion with staff about, um, you know, whether we're going to continue to have the, you know, the WebEx and the, the hybrid offerings as well. So uh, we'll have more information about that. And I would assume uh, associated information regarding summer programming, uh, all that we've got coming up in the next few months, I'm, I'm assuming we'll be making decisions and, and publicizing those decisions very soon. Yeah, correct, Mr. Mayor. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, there's an item on our consent agenda tonight um, related to some of the challenges we're having getting summer staffing um, that council is aware of. Uh, our intent right now is to is to move ahead, and um, you know, we're hopeful, as as Dr. Kelly says, that uh, we'll be able to continue to do so, recognizing that we're we're always going to be cautious that you know there may be a surprise around the corner we're going to proceed as if uh, we're going to be able to do these things. Council questions? Mr. Verbrugge or Dr. Kelly on any of this? If not, once again, thank you, Dr. Kelly, and please pass our thanks on to your staff and everybody in the Public Health Department for the work that they have done. Thank you so very much. Thank you. On to item 5.3 on our agenda which is an overview of the redistricting process that just took, uh, took place at the state level. Uh, obviously, once every 10 years we go through this as the census redraws the, uh, the political lines, the political boundaries in Congress and at the state legislature and at the city council level as well. So uh, Christina Scipioni, our city clerk, is here to fill us in on all things redistricting. Good evening. Welcome. Hello, Mayor and Council. I'm excited to be here today to talk redistricting. If elections are the Super Bowl um, for us election administrators, redistricting is like the planning process ahead of time, right? So it's really exciting to us. Um, for those um, in the audience, for those watching at home, if we can go to the next slide. Um, the purpose of redistricting is to redraw the boundaries of our election districts to evenly distribute the population. And so we conduct those after the federal census. The census was done in 2020, and then the following even-numbered year is when we have this fun redistricting process. Um, and so we will be looking at the 2020 census population data as we are going through our 2022 redistricting. 
So in Bloomington, this is the plan timeline for our redistricting process. So I'm here tonight to give an overview um, so folks understand how it works, kind of the, the rules, the requirements that we have to follow here at the city in order to redistrict, redistrict our council member districts and our precincts. On March 7th, so next week, I will be before the council with proposed maps for our council member districts and for our uh, precinct boundaries. We plan on publishing those maps on our website by the end of day um, this Thursday so that folks have time to take a look at them ahead of the meeting. They'll also be included in the council packet, of course. Um, that is a public comment opportunity. So we would love for members of the public um, to, to provide us with any feedback, any thoughts, any concerns that they have about those proposed redistricting maps at that March 7th meeting. And of course, City Council will be looking to you to provide any thoughts, directions that you have as well. Then what will happen is March 21st, we will come back with the actual um, council member district ordinance um, because redistricting is required to be done by ordinance for our districts and then a precinct map resolution for consideration. And so that is the official public hearing and so that's another opportunity for um, public input as well. Um, March 29th is the statutory deadline for redistricting um, and so I hate to be the burden of bearer of bad news, but um, state statute actually requires that council pay be withheld if redistricting is not complete. So it's a pretty compressed timeline that we're working with, right? Um, and so the reason for that, because um, I've had a lot of people say, why are you doing this so fast? Um, and the reason is really because we're sandwiched in between a lot of different redistricting processes. And so if I could have you go to the next slide, please. So there are, I like to think of them as three kind of main components of redistricting. First, you have the statewide redistricting, um, which was just recently completed, and those are our congressional districts, and then our state senate and state house of representative districts. Then we have our city redistricting, um, and within that, we're looking at our council member districts, and then we're looking at our precincts and our polling locations. Finally, then you have county redistricting. And so when we're looking at this process, this all needs to be done by mid-May in order for our um, candidates to actually file for office. And so that's why it's such a compressed time frame. We're sandwiched in between these two other redistricting processes. So the statewide redistricting um, happened, uh, the maps were released, I should say, on February 15th. Um, and those were issued by the Minnesota Judicial Branch Special Redistricting Panel. Um, the Judicial Branch um, appointed this panel and was holding hearings for most of last year um, regarding redistricting concerns around the state. Um, Bloomington remained in U.S. Congres Congressional District 3. And then we did have changes to our state legislative map. And so I'll have you go to the next slide, please. This is our existing map. Um, you can see kind of the layout of our um, legislative districts. And then if you move to the next page, we've got our redistricted map. And so that purple line represents where our um, House and Senate districts have changed. And you can see things have kind of shifted east a little bit. And then we have a smaller portion of the city in the north um, west area that's represented by a different house district. It kind of used to be a little bit more on the eastern side of the city. And for those of you watching at home, we do have these posted on our website if you'd like to see it in more detail. So now that these maps have been released, we can go to um, our city process. So I'll have you go to the next slide, please. And so the city charter lays out uh, the requirements for redistricting at the city level. Um, we have four city council districts, um, and they are set to represent the different quadrants of the city. And so to determine those districts, what our charter tells us is first, we divide the city um, by north and south by selecting an east-west street to divide, the, to divide the city up into north-south sections. Um, we have to redistrict on street center lines. Um, and as everybody I think in the city knows, we don't have a city, a street that actually goes completely <laughs> through the city. And so it gets a little wonky, usually on the western side of the city as we're going around the park. Um, but generally, we have to look at a contiguous street that is um, dividing the city into north-south halves. Then after that street has been determined, we um, can use north-south streets 
to then divide the city into east and west sections. And those do not need to be contiguous, the east-west, uh, or sorry, the north-south streets that divide into east-west. Next slide, please. So of course with redistricting, we need to look at the population within each of our council districts. And our charter states that the difference between the districts with the highest and the lowest population must be less than 5%. And so to determine what that range looks like, we take our total population, we divide it by our four districts, and then we look at what's okay up to two and a half percent above that center and what's two and a half below. And so then we have our range. And as you can see from this table here, um, we have district two is about a, it's 128 people below that target range, and district four is 142 people above that target range. And so what that means is we're fairly balanced. Um, per our charter, but we will need to make some small adjustments to our district boundaries in order to bring everything within that 5% range. I'll have you go to the next slide, especially for those at home who might want to see. Oh, these are our current council member districts. And so next week, what you'll be seeing in front of you then is a proposed map for the new districts and the new polling locations. Once we have the districts, then we can move on to our precincts and our polling places. And precincts and polling places are really administrative districts um, that allow us to administer elections efficiently for the members of our community. Um, and so we have some laws that we have to follow when we are drawing our, our precinct boundaries. Um, precinct boundaries cannot cross legislative boundaries. So they can't cross over into, they can't contain more than one legislative district. Um, and that includes our city council districts as well. And then we have to make sure we have a polling place that's within the precinct or up to one mile from um, the precinct boundary. Um, those polling places need to be ADA accessible, they have to be um, su have sufficient parking space, be free of alcohol and tobacco. Next slide. So in addition to those legal requirements for our precincts and our polling places, we also use redistricting as an opportunity to right size the precinct populations that we have. Um, all of our precincts use a variety of different buildings, right? And they have different capacity um, allowances, different parking. And so we take a look here in Bloomington. We don't just say, okay, well, every precinct should have 3,000 people in it and we're done. Sounds good. We actually take a look and see how many, how much, how many people we can serve out of a particular polling location. And then we work to right size our precincts so that we're being efficient as possible, um, but minimizing any excessive wait times at any of our polling locations. We also want to plan for future growth. Um, we know, we work with planning and we know <laughs> which areas of the cities we're gonna see growth and we wanna make sure that we're not over um, burdening a polling place um, in the future. And so we work to make sure that we've, we've anticipated where we're gonna have growth and that we have some capacity in those precincts and those polling locations. We also, um, this year, are planning to renumber our precincts sequentially within districts. <laughs> Um, it's very exciting to me as the administrator. It's probably not exciting to most of our voters. But um, what that means is, you know, we will start with District 1 and they'll have precincts 1 through 8 and then District 2. Um, I do think it will make it clearer to voters when we are reporting out results because I often get the question, well, I'm looking at District 4 and I see you have, you know, 1 and 32 in here. Where, where's the rest of the city? Um, and so that way, It'll be easier for us to explain to voters kind of how those districts work. Um, we've also received the request from Hennepin County to do, to do that renumbering as it helps them with absentee ballot administration. And then finally, after all that, um, we also, we do try to minimize the changes to voters polling locations when possible. Um, and that brings me, I'm gonna go back to our legislative map for a moment. If I could have you go to the next slide for me, please. So that brings me back to the, the map of the new legislative boundaries. And I just want to preview for everybody that I do expect us to have significant changes to our precinct boundaries based on, due to the fact that we have um, very significant changes to our legislative boundaries. And so quite a few of our existing precincts you can see are bisected now by that purple dotted line. And we have to make sure our precinct boundaries match that line. So I, I will come back next week with, with a significantly changed map. 
So once we have completed our work by March 29th, then the next step in the redistricting process is the county commissioner districts. And so the county has to, um, they have to redistrict their commissioner districts on our polling um, or our precinct boundaries. And so we need to be done with our process in order for them to move forward with their process. And if it makes you feel any better, they have an even more compressed timeline, right? They have from March 29th until April 26th to complete their redistricting process. After we have completed redistricting, those new district maps are effective for the August 9th, 2022 primary. In 2023, when we have our next municipal election, all four council member, member districts will be on the ballot. Um, districts one and two will have a two-year term, and then districts three and four will have a four-year term. So you may recall that um, in our 2021 elections, districts three and four had a two-year term. So we kind of flip-flop that, right? So each, each set of districts gets that two-year term either before or after redistricting. Current district council members' terms will all expire on December 31st then of 2023. Um, and from a communication standpoint, staff have created an interdepartmental team for our communications efforts, right? We are looking at um, how we use the briefing, how we use social media, how we use our community outreach and engagement contacts, how we use our apartment complex contacts to really do um, a wholesale engagement inf and information sharing effort after we have completed redistricting so that um, folks in our community know where they're supposed to go vote this year and in future years. And with that, um, that's the end of my presentation, but I'm here in case you have any questions. Well, thank you for that information. Uh, much appreciated. I, uh, I will say, I, early in my council career, I brought up the re renumbering of precincts, that it would make more sense, and was told it was simply undoable. So I'm glad <laughs> to see that somebody with a little more clout is actually going to get it done. That, that's good to hear. Uh, a question for you about the number of precincts and the population growth that we've had in Bloomington, and we will continue to see in Bloomington. At what point do we tip over to 33 precincts from our current number of 32? So there is no kind of statutory requirement for our precinct size, our precinct populations. It's really based on what we believe we can effectively serve, the number of, of registered voters that we believe we can effectively serve out of any given location. Um, given the fact that absentee voting has increased in population quite significantly, that actually decreases the number of people that are in our polling places. And that's one of the things that we're looking at. Now I will tell you we are not using 2020 absentee numbers in any of our kind of forecasting. Um, we are looking more at you know 2018, 2016 <laughs> data um, for what we might expect for an absentee turnout. Um, but that does significantly, as absentee goes up, that does significantly decrease the number of precincts we might need. And so I wouldn't necessarily equate population growth with the need to increase our precinct size. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. Yes. That's good. Council, questions on this? Clarifications of anything that we've heard tonight? Knowing full well that we're going to see you back at least a couple more times in the next 30 days or so? Well, hearing none, thank you. Thanks for, for the presentation and the update and the information, and thanks for the work that I, I know that you and your staff are going to be putting in over the next 30 days to get this done for us. So, Thank you, Mayor and Council. Well see you next week. Thank you. Moving on in our agenda. Uh, items 5.4, 5, 5, and 6 are annual reports and work plans for three of our commissions, uh, and one, two commissions and one board, and actually that's part of our city charter is that our commissions and boards are required to come before the city council and do uh, an annual report from the previous year and lay out their work plan for the upcoming year. We've been working through uh, a couple. We've had a couple over the past few weeks, and we're, as I said, going to be hearing tonight from the Human Rights Commission, the Creative Placemaking Commission, and the HRA Board. And we are going to start with item 5.4, uh, the annual report and work plan of our Human Rights Commission. And I'd like to welcome tonight uh, our chair of our Human Rights Commission, Molly Bosu. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, and good evening, Council members. Um, so it's my pleasure tonight to stand before you to share our 2021 annual report and our current year's work plan. Awesome. Thank you. You can go to the next slide. All right, so the purpose of the Bloomington Human Rights Commission, which was founded in 1968 in the wake of Dr. King's assassination, 
Um, it's the aid and advise the city council in all matters of human rights and equal opportunity for all of our residents. Next slide. And so on this slide, you'll find a list of our commissioners. As you can see, we've had a little turnover in terms of our youth commissioners um, in September of this year as two of our youth commissioners um, finished out their two-year term. And so although 2021 brought the continued challenges of the pandemic, our year was a productive one um, in which we are working to continue the, and we are working to continue that momentum into this year. Um, I'll start first with our 2021 annual report. So our 2021 work plan focused on six key areas, including policy and program research and community and educational events. Um, I'll provide throughout these um, focus areas, I'll pro provide some key highlights from our last year. All right, so starting us off, um, we'll start with some of our community and educational events. Early on in 2021, so in January of 2021, in coordination with some of our outreach from Martin Luther King Jr. Day, we supplied over 20 little free libraries across, um, all across Bloomington with children's books related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We helped select the books and then we delivered them throughout the city. And so you can see some evidence there and some pictures of our um, work there. Um, along with the Planning Commission, we, be, we came before you in June of last year to recommend that Bloomington join the Just Deeds Coalition. This resolution was unanimously, unanimously approved by the council and authorized and directed us um, to work on community education about racially restrictive covenants um, and to facilitate the discharge of these covenants. So since then, um, there were three HRA-owned properties that had these racially restrictive covenants. Those have since been discharged, and we have also received requests from residents to do the same. Um, we have hosted some educational events, um, particularly a table at the farmer's market, and we, um, in order to kind of get the word out regarding the Just Deeds um, resolution, and we're going to continue that outreach moving forward. This is still very much a work in progress, and it is and it will continue to be a key essential feature of our 2022 work plan. In August of last year, Bloomington held its first Pride event in which we partnered with the city and community members to celebrate our LGBTQ plus community. Nearly 2,000 residents attended this event on the East Lawn with food, music, games, and performances. Um, this intergenerational event celebrated the struggles and achievements of all people to live their true authentic, authentic selves. So as part of our annual and ongoing work, the Human Rights Commission writes and revises city proclamations related to the human rights of all of our residents. And as you'll see in our upcoming work plan, um, we have spent some time this past year amending and expanding the proclamations listed here to increase their inclusivity. We had some uh, few key special projects in 2021. Um, one of the most notable was the adoption of the ban on conversion therapy for minors and vulnerable adults in Bloomington. Our commissioners, along with the health of city staff and community organizations, worked countless hours preparing the recommendation, which was adopted by the council in April. Since then, we've worked with legal staff to design a reporting mechanism that is now up on our city's webpage, and the conversion therapy ban went in, officially went into effect on January 3rd of this year. Another key special project was providing representation on the Racial Equity Strategic Planning Committee. This was, as you know, led by Faith Jackson and other facilitators. The work group brought the recommendations for policy and program solutions to you. And our commissioner, Leslie Taylor, was our representative on this committee. Also, as you know, um, annually, the Human Rights Commission asks for nominations for the Omar Bondarud Human Rights Award. And becoming our 43rd recipient, the 2001, or 2021 sorry, um, Omar Bondrud Award recipient went to Oasis for Youth, which works to assist housing unstable youth in our community. So accessibility to the city's digital media was a priority for us in 2021 as well. Um, through conversations with the city, we now have closed captioning on all of our city videos as of June of 2021. Next, um, we La early last year, we received a donation from a resident, Roberta Zohara, of a peace pole. So we worked closely with her to find a fitting location um, for the peace pole, which is now installed at Normandale Lake Park. 
Um, she had personally selected the eight languages on the poll to represent a wide geographic and ethnic diversity of, of different languages, including languages that have been historically marginalized in this modern era. And lastly, um, we have promoted the Human Rights Commission activities in Bloomington Briefing, um, videos on the city's webpage, and through our social media accounts. So, so that was 2021. Um, at this point, I'm going to pivot to our upcoming 2022 work plan. And so in the development of this year's work plan, we were led through a facilitated discussion with city staff. Um, the first step along this process was to determine what a successful work plan would look like. So really we were asked, you know, at the end of 2022, um, if you look back on the work that you did, how will you, you know, what do you want to see? What do you want to, um, what will really measure your success? And so through that process, we came up with our guiding principles, um, which you can see up here. We want to be connected to the city's strategies. We want to have a real impact on current policies and on people's lives. Um, we want to be visible in the community, and we want success that, um, we want to create some success criteria that we will be able to measure. And so in 2022, um, we kind of amended a little bit of our focus area, or focus area categories, um, focusing on our annual, you know, categorizing them as annual and ongoing initiatives, initiatives that will continue from our last year's work plan, our new initiatives, and then our partnerships. So several of our annual and ongoing um, initiatives are ones that have already been mentioned as part of, of course, our 2021 annual work plan or our annual report. However, we really hope to be able to revitalize some of these activities that have been on our work plan but have really been stalled um, since 2020. So these would include holding a naturalization ceremony um, and hosting community welcome meals. And then already this year, we have provided funding for the Bloomington Public Schools to purchase books related to the work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. These books focus on civil rights, diversity, and racial equity with the intent of sparking um, con conversation and inspiring young readers. I also want to make note here that um, although this is in our upcoming work plan, um, we did receive, uh, the City of Bloomington did receive a score for the Municipal Equality Index, which is um, put out through the Human Rights Campaign. And our score this year was uh, 82 out of a total of 100 points. And so that was up five points from last year. Um, there were three kind of key areas in which we made some improvement, um, but most notably related to the work of the Human Rights Commission was the, um, and your work as well, but was the ban on conversion therapy. So as alluded to previously, we've been doing the work to expand our proclamations to be more inclusive, including the addition of a Black History Month proclamation this year. Um, we'll continue to work to expand these proclamations to represent the diversity of Bloomington residents. We'll also continue to work closely with the Planning Commission, city, and legal staff to promote the Just Deeds Initiative. Although staffing issues, has, staffing issues have slowed um, this project down, we are in a good position to continue our efforts to promote and connect with residents in order to get these covenants discharged and to create educational events and material on the legacy of these covenants in our city today. Um, we will be meeting as a work group in March to discuss our next steps. The Human Rights Commission will focus on two um, key new initiatives this year. The first is the development of a clear direction and vision that's aligned with your strategic priorities, um, the city's strategic priorities, and other boards and commissions work plans. A work group will begin to develop or begin the development of this in the upcoming months. And we'll seek out opportunities to delve into the work of other city entities um, to find words, ways to collaborate and to create um, greater conversation, greater ideas and solutions. And then as a key, a key human rights issue, um, our second new initiative for 2022 is a focus on housing. We have already met with the city planner and the racial equity coordinator to, to determine what might be the greatest priorities um, and brainstorm ways in which the Human Rights Commission can work on these same goals. Next steps would include meeting with other, city, with other city, school, and community groups to continue our information gathering and to start narrowing in on a focus area within that realm of housing. Uh, work groups will be determined and begin this work in the upcoming months. 
And then lastly, in our category of partnerships, um, the Human Rights Commission is committed to partnering with other entities to promote the work of human rights. One such partnership in 2022 will be with artistry and community co uh, committees to celebrate Pride Month, Pride Month through the Come As You Are art exhibition that will celebrate the LGBTQ plus community and the 50th anniversary of Twin Cities Pride Festival. This exhibit will run June 3rd through July 8th in the Inez Green Book Gallery. We will also partner with uh, partner to host a second annual Pride celebration. On top of this, the HRC uh, has representation on the Bloomington Public Schools DDAC Committee, or the Diversity Equity and sorry District Equity and Diversity Advisory Committee, um, and we'll partner with the Bloomington or sorry the Minnesota Department of Human Rights and work to align our work with other boards and commissions. So, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me here tonight. And um, at this time, I would take any questions that the council may have. Thank you, Chair Bosu. Council questions? Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. So in reviewing the work plan, I really appreciated, well, there was a lot that I appreciated, but um, I liked that you talked a lot about um, partnering with other commissions or looking for opportunities where there's intersecting um, work. And one of the things that I didn't see was uh, partnering with the Sustainability Commission. Mm -hmm. And I do think obviously there's a, a lot of environmental justice issues out there in the world. So I'd hope that that would be yeah. a place that there's some work done too, mm -hmm. or at least assessed for opportunities. Yes, thank you, Councilman uh, Carter. Um, that's a great point. And there has definitely been some discussion about um, multiple commissions in which we would definitely have been in alignment with. Um, in fact, early in 2021, we did um, invite the Sustainability Commission to one of our meetings. And so we did um, hear about their work plan. There was definitely some energy around that environmental justice initiative and the, the ways in which that works and how we can partner with that. Since then, um, we that hasn't like necessarily taken the necessary steps that I think maybe we need to take. Um, but I think with this focus on partnering with the commissions, I think that is, um, that's definitely on our radar. Okay. And then I just have one other question. Um, so after the last Pride Festival, which was obviously a huge success and super exciting, uh, there was some conversation around maybe approaching it in a different way. Um, and I'm just wondering if we'll use kind of the same approach, the same model, or if another organization is hosting, or what does that look like? Yeah, if so you know that at this point, right? Yeah, and that's also a great question. Um, I know that we that um, discussion has not yet happened, um, but I know that in the upcoming months we'll start determining which of our members will be partnering with our community members, um, and possibly having conversations with Mary Bussey and um, other people in order to have that conversation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Lohman and then Councilmember D'Alessandro. Councilmember Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and thank you for your leadership uh, with the uh, Human Rights Commission. It's a great commission and uh, I've done some fantastic work over the years and I'm looking forward to seeing what, what we uh, will see in the future. Um, I did have a question about the Human Rights uh, Campaign. Uh, um, I saw that we got to the 85. What do we do to get ourselves into that 90s uh, category, 95, 96? Mm -hmm. um, um, on that. So happy that we have the, the Pride Festival uh, here rather than having to go to Minneapolis to celebrate that. Uh, just really just tickled by that. But is there, is there, what are other communities doing to get themselves up into that, that 90 uh, range? Thank you, Councilmember Lohman. Um, that is, that's a great question. Um, I actually just received the report out of the, the score um, from last month. And I believe that, um, and I, Diane can correct me uh, if I'm wrong. Diane, Tracy forward. Smith uh, is working through the city. You want to speak to that? Yes, Mayor and, and Council. As a matter of fact, Tracy Smith, who is uh, a coordinator with our Community Outreach Engagement Division, will be uh, approaching the Human Rights Commission and meeting with them, I think, on the March agenda right now to talk about what could possibly be done so that we can increase our score on the MEI. Well, thank you. I hope that we'll be able to utilize resources uh, to be able to uh, make that a reality, uh, that there are no barriers uh, for us to be able to, to, to do that. Uh, again, thanks for your, uh, your, your work uh, with that and so many other issues. Thank you. Councilmember D'Alessandro. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Good to see you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for all your work. Uh, you all do great work, and I appreciate um, uh certainly uh, had the exact same question that Councilmember Carter did around um, weaving, uh, especially in light of our recent climate emergency designation that uh, we weave in uh, climate and sustainability issues into human rights work. So happy to hear you guys have been thinking about that too. Look forward to hearing more about that. Um, in your, um, in your uh, you know, measures of success or your or guiding principles, you define uh, the notion of indexing or how we will measure Mm -hmm. You know, I'd, I'm curious if you can share with us any of the current musings or thoughts about what those might be, what, you know, whether they're qualitative, quantitative, and, mm -hmm. and how you all might be thinking about that as you approach the work plan. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in the upcoming months, we will be um, formulating more of our, our, you know, within our commission, our work groups that will really focus on the key initiatives. And so um, we do, we will be onboarding a new commissioner next month, and we really wanted to make sure that she was part of that process. And so as we move into that, um, the conversation that we've had is within those work groups, each of us you know, within whatever the initi initiatives are, um, creating those kind of independently and then bringing them back to the commission um, for some feedback. Um, but in terms of, I think, what a lot of our commissioners would like to see is I, I really do think that there's definitely some energy around um, that policy and program research and, and looking at what policies within the city with within, um, you know, can we, can we affect change? Um, so I think a lot of the commission um, would feel like success oftentimes, or would would look at success as you know some effect on policy. And it doesn't just need to be that. I know that there's lots of ways in which we can affect change, um, but I think that is that is something that we're hoping to see. Council, anything else? Any additional questions? Well, again, thank you, Chair Bosu, for you and your commission's work, uh, especially looking forward to the, the naturalization ceremony is always a highlight and missed it over the last couple of years. And, and so I've never attended one. I was That was pre my time on the council. Can't wait for that to, uh, to be rebooted again well. and come back again. So. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you, and please uh, express our appreciation to the rest of the Human Rights Commission for their work. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thanks, you too. Item 5.5. On our agenda is a, our next 2021 update and 2022 work plan. This is the Creative Placemaking Commission. And we'll be hearing from our Director of Creative Placemaking, Alejandra Palenka. There you are. Good evening. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Hello, Mayor. Hello, Council members. Thank you so much for having us. I'm going to see if my team members are able to pop on. Uh, so that we can all introduce ourselves. Um, again, my name is Alejandra Palenka, Director of Creative Placemaking. Uh, Kevin, are you able to come on board? Go. I see Kevin like working. Himself? His name just popped up. I think we're we're working Great. on it here. I am here. Good there evening, everyone. Kevin is here in in voice and spirit. So off you go, and then I see uh, Jackie as well. And Carly, oh, the folks just keep coming in. They're very good. Jackie, if you'd like to just briefly introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jackie Rosenbush. I'm the chair of the Creative Placemaking Commission. Thanks for having me tonight. And then we have Carly. And I don't know if Carly um, is able to unmute, but I'll introduce her. If you haven't met Carly yet, she is new with artistry. We're really pleased to have her as our staff liaison as the new director. So that's our team for tonight and they'll be on um, for any questions at the end. And I see um, Shane, do you wanna just announce yourself as well? I'm not sure if Shane could, but Shane Ridling, of course, is on the line as well at the end for any uh, questions. So I'm going to share my screen here if you just allow me a moment. All 
right. Well, thanks again, everyone. Tonight, I'm going to present our 2022 work plan for the Creative Placemaking Commission. Uh, this work plan is really shaped by the South Loop District Creative Placemaking Plan, which was developed by the City of Bloomington in partnership with Artistry and approved by Council and Artistry Board of Directors in 2015. So one outcome of the plan included the formation of our Creative Placemaking Commission, and the Commission advises the City Council in using arts, design, culture, and creativity to help accomplish the city's goal for change, growth, and transformation of the South Loop District in a way that also builds character and quality of place in Bloomington. The creative placemaking plan vision and goals have guided our work plan strategies and our project priorities. And the vision is that our sustained creative placemaking efforts will establish the South Loop as a distinctive destination known for welcoming people and using the arts to transform the neighborhood physically, socially, and culturally. Um, so our goals are urbanism, animation, involvement, identity, leadership, and investment. And those are all expanded upon a little bit more in our work plan document. So in 2020, the commission participated in a practical visioning workshop. And we asked ourselves, given what we know of our creative placemaking plan, what elements do we want to see in the next three years as a result of our actions? So we focused on grand and colorful places to play, welcoming and thriving green spaces, walkable, engaging urban amenities, cohesive and distinct wayfinding, intentional and equitable engagement of stakeholders, and safe and accessible mobility hub. And then in 2021, commissioners participated in an action planning session to determine how we would like to prioritize and implement strategies. So I'll start off here with a brief overview of some projects that we worked on in 2021. We wrapped six more utility boxes in designs by local artists, which were selected by a stakeholder panel. Uh, the designs shown here are by Robin Brower, Luis Fitch, Jose Reboyo, John C. Gerber, Shakuntula Maheshwari, and Leah Yellowbird. We also launched our South Loop Public Art Audio Tour within the AutoCast app, joining over 250 guides across the country um, and being the first guide based here in Minnesota. And the goal is really to get people more engaged with the artwork, encourage exploration, and spend more time enjoying the area. So if you scan that QR code, that'll bring you directly to download the app to access it. We also distributed our Creative Spark request for proposals. We had an information session for interested applicants. Um, we had a stakeholder selection panel select four sculptures. Uh, one was installed in the fall of 2021, and that's this bench on the upper right hand corner by Daniela Bianchini. The rest are anticipated to be installed in spring or summer of this year, all in or around Bloomington Central Station Park. And those artists are Safa Sarvistani, Greg Mueller, and Kao Li Tao. One of our large scale projects was the installation of the Wee Mural Tapestry, which was completed by 10 local BIPOC artists. The mural is located on two walls um, facing American Boulevard and 30th Avenue and installation took place throughout August and September of 2021. A big thank you to the curators Oishi Creative and the artists Andres Guzman and C. Ryder, City Mischief featuring Thomasina Top Bear and Tom J, Marlena Miles, Marcia Tometz, Reggie LaFleur, and Oishi Creative. And then of course our partners as well, Metro Transit, McGough, and Excel Energy. We worked with the curator and artist team Oishi Creative to implement a sunset block party in September to celebrate the completion of the Wee Mural. And this event included interactive installations and creative activities, food trucks, music, and performances. We also partnered with the Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge on an event to formally finally celebrate the completion of the old Cedar Avenue bridge restoration and area improvements. The event featured remarks, including our guest, Senator Klobuchar, uh, food trucks, live music, commemorative posters, and nature-based activities. And people were excited to celebrate with us. We gave away 200 meal tickets and cupcakes within the first hour of the event. We are also very excited to install the Goldfinch and South Loop signage by artist Donald Lipsky at the corner of Killebrew and Old Shakopee Road. Uh, the sculpture reflects on more than the 250 migratory birds that pass through the nearby refuge. 
We noticed a lot of attention on social media for this, particularly from very enthusiastic birders here and across the country uh, that were excited to see this sculpture both in transport and installed. Uh, just a few other uh, things that we participated in 2021 include uh, an ice sculpture exploration. Um, we also created art plaques and signage for all existing public art projects, some of which will be installed this spring and summer. Uh, we participated in the Mall of America Minnesota Made Art Fair, and we saw the South Loop History Report was completed. All right, so I'll move on to 2022 upcoming projects and events and areas of focus. So we recently placed a South Loop ice wall at the Luminary Hike at Old Cedar Avenue Bridge Trailhead. And this was in partnership with the, again, the Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge. And the ice sculpture exploration also had a sculpture with a, with it placed right in front of the new fiddle, oh, I'm sorry, right in front of Fiddlehead Coffee Co. We're partnering with Parks and Recreation to develop the vacant site, which is right next to the new fire station number three at Old Shakopee and 86th into a community garden and a small pocket park for the neighborhood. So the next step will really be to work with a landscape designer to consider seeding, signage, some native planting at the site, and they would consult with the new gardeners and other stakeholders to inform the design. A few other projects of focus in 2022 include offering free workbooks to Bloomington artists, including artists working in community and work of art business skills for artists. These are two guides and workbooks created by Springboard for the Arts, and we're offering them for free to Bloomington artists to help grow local capacity. Um, we'd also, we're also working to uh, revisit the scope of a creative placemaking project in a previously identified neighborhood focus area. We also are looking to develop the scope for it, the identified element of grand and colorful places to play with an emphasis on projects that reflect on South Loop history and Native American and Indigenous history. Uh, and we'd also like to partner with Parks and Recreation uh, potentially on a Friday Night Live event this summer at Bloomington Central Station Park. And then we also would like to offer a public art workshop, again, to grow that local capacity and help develop public art and creative placemaking uh, skill sets. So creative placemaking and public art processes and installations have the potential to uplift the neighborhood spirits, build community resilience, provide connection and hope, add to the livability factor, support the local economy and support entrepreneurs, specifically artists. Uh, research also shows that communities with a vibrant cultural scene are more desirable to live in. They have greater economic stability and they attract a more diverse and educated workforce. The previous Bloomington Creative MN report found that the arts and culture sector has a $12.1 million economic impact on the city of Bloomington, fosters 296 full-time equivalent jobs in addition to nearly $900,000 in government revenues. So this really, again, demonstrates an impactful contribution to local service providers, retailers, restaurants, and the overall economy. So investment in the creative economy really offers a strong return on investment. So we just wanted to also take this moment to thank council for your ongoing support of this work. All right, so I've cut it there because I know you have a lot on your agenda, but I welcome any questions any of you may have and maybe I'll start my sharing here. Well, thank you for that report and for the work that uh, has been done over the past year and the past several years to improve the art in Bloomington. Great cities have great art, and uh, that's what we have here in Bloomington, and really do appreciate it. Council, any questions, comments? Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor, uh, and, and thank you for this presentation. As somebody that lives just down the street from where a lot of these installations are going up, it's really fun every couple of weeks to see something new kind of making the neighborhood vibrant. So uh, in terms of uh, a lot of the feedback I get from folks is, is saying these are, are really fun. I would love to see stuff like this coming to my neighborhood across the community. With the neighborhood focus areas, I guess kind of two questions. Do we have an idea when some of the projects uh, that we're just putting out a call for now might start coming to fruition? And what are... And, and I know it's kind of guessing right now, but what would the scale of those projects likely, likely be? Are we looking utility wraps or would this be larger installations potentially? Yes, thank you, Councilmember Martin. Um, so 
Originally, so we have funding for one previously identified neighborhood focus area and previously before the pandemic, we had identified possibly doing creative wayfinding, um, but we're put, we put plans on hiatus on pause due to, due to the pandemic. So since then, creative placemaking commissioners have revisited the scope and we've kind of thought about what are some other ways it may be more uplifting to the community after all that we've all experienced over the last few years. And so right now we're looking at ways to scatter kind of smaller but visible projects throughout that neighborhood focus area. Um, one example are poetry signs. So kind of artistic or creative poetry signs with poetry um, submitted by students, um, either locally at the high school or middle school or um, residents of Bloomington. And so we've also discussed things like sidewalk poetry um, or kind of smaller installations kind of sprinkled throughout the community so that that makes helps make that neighborhood very distinct and has it, you know, become a feature within that neighborhood specifically. Um, so that's just that's for that one specific neighborhood focus area. That was something um, that was provided to us in the past for a budget. Gotcha. Thank you. Council additional comments, questions? Council member D'Alessandro. I guess my question kind of dovetails on yours, Patrick. And it may not be for our friends at the Creative Placemaking uh, Commission, but um, maybe to us to think about is just how do we expand the concept of creative place make, making over the course of the you know the years to the city as a whole or are there as we do community economic development is that a component that we can carry into those nodes etc so um but uh, alejandra it's nice to meet you it's the first time i've gotten the chance to talk to you thank you for all your work um i, I really appreciate the diversity of of talent that you are uh finding in in our community and are bringing to the forefront here as part of what you do so thank you i Really looking forward to 2022. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you very much. Anything else, Council? Well, I I will say uh, to all of you uh, from our our commission, despite the challenges of the past two years, uh, you accomplished quite a bit last year, and some very memorable kind of projects that I think stood out and got everyone's attention and uh, were wonderful. And it leaves you with a uh, uh, a big bar to clear for this year because uh, you did so well last year. And uh, so, but uh, no doubt that you can do it and looking forward to seeing what you come forward with. But uh, thanks. Thank you for your work and please share the council's thanks to the rest of the Creative Placemaking Commission uh, for their commitment to making uh, remarkable art and making this a remarkable city because of it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, council members. Thank you. Council, I got uh, so swept up uh, moving to creative placemaking that I neglected to look for a motion to approve our the Human Rights Commission 2022 work plan as approved. And then we have to do the creative placemaking 2022 work plan as well. So to keep things in order here, uh, I would like to I'd, I'd look for a motion to approve the Human Rights Commission's 2022 work plan as presented in item 5.4. So moved, Coulter. Second, Martin. We have a motion by Councilmember Coulter, a second by Councilmember Martin to approve the Human Rights Commission's 2022 work plan as presented. No further council discussion on this. Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. And now our item 5.5, .5, uh, Council, I would look for a motion to approve the Creative Placemaking Commission 2022 work plan and meeting calendar. So moved. Second. Motion by Council Member Martin, second by Council Member Carter to approve the Creative Placemaking Commission 2022 work plan and meeting calendar. No further council discussion on this. Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Uh, thank you for your indulgence on that, and I apologize for overlooking that on the way through. Uh, again, excuse members me, of our Mr. creative, creative placemaking Mr. Mayor, excuse me for just one second. I apologize. Mr. Brillhart, uh, when we close these doors because of activity outside, it actually locks. I don't know if we can unlock the doors themselves. I, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure they're generally unlocked. We'll take a look at it and see if we can prop it open slightly. Pardon me, Mr. Mayor. Thanks. Yes. Um, so thank you for that. Thanks, thanks for the reminder. Actually, I think I 
I have a key up on my desk that we could do, but uh, it's just a hex key. We could make it work. So, uh, again, thank you so very much to our, our folks, uh, Ali, Carly, Kevin, uh, Jackie. Thank you for your work and share our thanks with the rest of the Creative Placemaking Commission. And uh, as I said, look forward to what you've got planned for 2022. Um, after the successes of 2021, um, looking forward to what you have uh, to, to show us in the future. So, thank you very much. Thanks again, Mayor and Council Members. Moving on to item 5.6 on our agenda. This is, uh, this is where I was probably confused because this is just an informational uh, uh, item and there's no action required on this. This is a, uh, a review of the HRA's 2022 work plan. And our uh, HRA Administrator, Erica Coleman, is here to lead us through this. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Glad to be here. This Good evening. to see you in person. I know. Glad and you're a here. smile. Yes. yes. <laughs> So thank you. I do have a uh, short slide presentation that I will have shared and I can walk through. Thank you. So this evening I'll bring forward the HRA Board 2022 Work Plan. Next slide. So I just want to start with what the HRA Board is. It's a five-member board that... Uh, is appointed by the mayor with the approval of the city council. And the purpose, according to Minnesota statutes, chapter 469 of the HRA is to provide a sufficient supply of adequate, safe and sanitary dwellings in order to protect the health, safety, morals and welfare of the city of the citizens of Bloomington to clear and redevelop blighted areas to perform those duties according to comprehensive plans and to remedy the shortage of housing for low and moderate income residents and to redevelop blighted areas in situations in which private enterprise would not act without government participation or subsidies. Next slide. In 2021, I wanted to bring forward the board that was in 2021 for our accomplishments. And that consists of Cheryl Lewis, John Olson, Victoria Huhim, Council Member Jack Beloga and Mark Thorson. And at the end of 2021, um, John Olson did step down and Council Member Beloga did step down as he ended his term as council member. Next slide, please. So I wanted to start with the accomplishments. Um, this is not all the accomplishments, but I will go through them in your packet is a list. But I wanted to show you first, the HRA got a new logo. The previous logo just said HRA, and I don't think anybody knew where or what it was. <laughs> so we updated it to be more in sync with the city, as you can see that we did build off of the city of Bloomington's logo to show that the Housing and Redevelopment Authority is in and for the city of Bloomington. We also provided an annual report. Uh, it was the first housing report that we have done. Um, so in 2020, we did, or for 2020, in 2021, we did provide an annual report, and there will be another report coming out. It'll be a housing report later uh, this year by the end of first quarter. We also um, streamed our meetings. We came into the council chambers and streamed every meeting. So we are in the council chambers during every single meeting now unless there's a conflict, such as elections. Um, and then we stream them on the Bloomington YouTube channel. We also held um, what I was told uh, by our planning manager. I think he's been here 16 years or longer. Does not recall a concurrent HRA or and planning commission meeting. So we held actually two of them now. Um, so that was exciting. We did... Um, complete, uh, release the racially restricted covenant from the HRA owned property that we have through the Just Deeds program as the Human Rights Commission did bring up. And then we opened properties with affordable components. And so what we have here is Blooming Meadows North, Lindale Flats, the district, and we have um, Hayden Grove, which that is the ribbon cutting that I couldn't make it super big, but a lot of you are in there. Additional accomplishments that are not listed, because um, they weren't pretty pictures, <laughs> was that we did have a, a three-year strategic plan and an annual plan. The HRA has not had an annual plan in recent years to present, but we did have one last year and moving forward with this one this year. Excuse me. We participated in the board member interview and recommendation process that the city council has identified. 
And, excuse me, we uh, did a lot of studies and special projects that um, were really, really beneficial. So the CDBG, Community Development Block Grant, CV, Coronavirus Funding, excuse me, we were able to provide housing assistance funding and community uh, collaborations, special TIF legislation for the property at uh, 98th and Aldrich, as well as 700 American. Home Improvement Loan Program Refresh. That was a big one, and we are very excited about doing that. We did a housing resource engagement where we came to community and we used community-based organizations as well as other city departments. Um, that was actually at the Days Inn around um, people that were experiencing long-term homelessness to bring resources to them, and it was really amazing to have that collaboration. Mortgage and down payment assistance. Uh, we, did, we were able pro to provide this through uh, the CDBG coronavirus funding that the city council did approve. We also are providing um, through the ARP funding that the council did approve, um, and that'll be rolled out uh, in 2022, in addition to homelessness response prevention services where that was funding that the council did approve through ARP, um, and working with Bloomington Public Schools and looking into other um, opportunities such as street outreach and the collaboration with our Bloomington Police Department, public health, environmental health, and many others. Um, last but not least, we had additional properties um, or opportunities. So the Days In site, we are moving forward with that. <laughs> 8012 Old Cedar is under construction. It was approved in 2021, and so it is under construction now. And that will provide some uh, more affordability. And we did uh, provide an MOU, so a Memorandum of Understanding, with West Hennepin Affordable Housing Land Trust around opportunities for affordable housing development on an HRA-owned property at the time, at this time, as well as additional grants and funding from Met Council Livable Communities Development Grants. Next slide. So our 2022 board consists of Cheryl Lewis as chair, Victoria Huhim as vice chair, Mark Thorson as secretary, council member Nathan Coulter, and council member Patrick Martin. Next slide. In 2022, we do have four high level areas that we have broken up for the work plan. So first is operational, which is to review and make recommendations um, of support and or approve proposed modification revisions. So reviewing federally funded program administration plans and policies. One of the things that's included here is our Section 8 admin plan. Section 8 is one of our larger programs where we provide housing assistance. And so just reviewing um, that administration plan and policies. Review the service assessment recommendations. The HRA is undergoing a service assessment at this time. Um, and so we'll be reviewing those rec service recommendations um, and looking forward to more operational efficiency where we can. A customer client feedback survey. So our customer experience survey, we are using Let's Talk Bloomington as a project page to launch this to encourage our participants of all of our programs and activities to receive, to provide feedback for us. And it actually just went live today and we will be doing more promotion around that. And then technology software selection implementation. The HRA um, in administering quite a few of its programs is mostly just on paper. And so we do have a lot of files and we're looking to integrate and upgrade with technology for the HRA and how we do our work. Next slide. So our studies and special projects as we uh, continue some of these, we are working with um, other divisions and departments. And so there's some things on here that we really work closely with planning as well as public work. So the update of single family and two family requirements, we are with the, in the study sessions and working with planning on recommendations with that, but it is planning's lead. Single room occupancy standards, as well as the 98th Street Corridor and study for future redevelopment, which public works bringing that forward. Um, housing amendments, data tracking and outreach, this is the opportunity housing ordinance as well as other data around foreclosures or lack thereof, <laughs> um, as well as opportunities for um, homeownership opportunities. Homelessness prevention and response services, this is continuing upon the funding that city council has made available, as well as the home buyer mortgage assistance program, getting that uh, launched this year with the funding made available. Next slide. 
We do have ongoing initiatives. Um, so our ongoing initiatives, reviewing and making recommendations on racial equity initiatives, community engagement, and other issues as they arise. This also includes some of our work groups that we have, the down payment assistance work group that some staff participate in, the Bloomington Housing Action Team that we do lead, the NOAA working group as well, as well as some regional groups that we are a part of as staff on affordable housing and equity, equity standards in housing in Bloomington. And lastly, but not leastly, is pres preservation development and redevelopment. So we lead, collaborate, and or support various aspects related to housing preservation and housing and economic development and redevelopment. So our 2030 affordable housing goals, we're always working towards those. I will say that at the end of 2021, we were at 76% of our affordable housing goals by 2030. Um, and we're really on track to exceed the goals. Uh, development gap assistance, we do help uh, administer uh, with finance because the city's products of affordable housing trust fund, the revolving low fund, loan fund, to get to more affordable unit creation as well as tax increment financing to help provide that gap. And then acquisition and disposition of HRA owned property. We do uh, purchase substandard property, uh, it's often called blighted property, that we can remove the structure and sell the land for ownership or housing development. And then as well as home ownership development opportunities. Uh, we are looking at different opportunities with, such as West Hennepin Affordable Housing Land Trust, but also other partners that have done work in Bloomington in prior years and those that are looking to do more because we have a lot of interest in home ownership development. And then our commercial nodes redevelopment, uh, really prioritizing the areas of commercial nodes in the city of Bloomington. And that is all I have for you this evening. And I will stand for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Coleman. Appreciate that. Appreciate the information and the work that gets done by the HRA. And I know it's it's a handful. And it's a lot that has gone on, especially over the last couple of years. Council questions, comments? Councilmember D'Alessandro and then Councilmember Carter. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Ms. Coleman. That, um, I'd, I'd have to have sit down with you for eight hours to go through all of that. That's so much work. So congratulations on a really great year and setting us up really successfully. I had two specific questions for you. Um, one was um, in light of our uh, overachievement, if you will, around our, our goals for 2030. Is there a, is there a, a, a process of looking at um, or maybe a definitional uh, understanding for things like um, deeply affordable as opposed to just at the 80% mark or whatever. I'm just curious if you've thought about raising the bar a little bit or, or if there's some work we can do there. So one question for you there. And then the second question related to that is, especially around HRA owned properties or properties where you're were actively participating, is there an opportunity for you to partner from a sustainability perspective with the work we're doing around the energy audit so that we can prioritize um, some of the the redevelopment funding and things like that towards some of those things that help us achieve those goals as well. Thank you. Thank you, Coleman. Mayor and Council Member D'Alessandro. I really appreciate your question. So in the um, affordable housing goals, it is a 30 to 80 percent AMI that is included for the um, sorry, 30 to 60 percent AMI that is included for the affordable housing goals. And so it is parsed out for 30%, 50%, and 60%. So yes, there is a focus on working towards in, um, the 30% AMI for the deeply affordable and below. Right now we are at 33 units um, for deeply affordable for 30% AMI. And so that is where we have the largest gap to achieve our goals um, for that. And so what that looks like is more investment public investment and leveraging other public dollars and opportunities at the federal, state, or local levels. So yes, there is a focus on that and there is numbers, um, target numbers that are different than 80%. In terms of partnering with sustainability, um, really appreciate the question. So we do have 41 single family owned properties. Out of the 41, 21 are a part of our Rental Homes for Future Home Buyers program, and 20 are used for our project-based uh, Section 8 units. 
We have been in talks with Emma Stress around um, different opportunities that we can look at in one, starting with increasing the sustainability and the energy efficiency of our own properties and teaching and providing education about the residents that live in those properties. That's still in conversation, but we definitely have brought it forward and we're both on the same page of saying, yes, we wanna start with our properties and set that example um, to show our residents in Bloomington. As well as we're looking at other opportunities to assist with different energy efficiency, we do um, provide on an annual basis. Um, energy for the, sorry, I think of the acronym, but it is with CEE, so Center for Energy and Environment, and they have the Home Energy Squad. We, uh, City of Bloomington, excuse me, through the CDBG grant does provide funding for that, and that's just one initiative that we continue to keep going, but we are looking for other ways, so yes. Thank you for that. Yeah, just a follow up on that. Uh, Council Member Nelson and I have both, I think, remarked on other occasions that moving from providing assistance for the audit to assistance for the work is gonna be a, a great part of that, and I think you'd find some support, uh, certainly here, to, to talk more about that in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I agree, really, a lot of work and a lot of really exciting and energizing work and thank you so much for your leadership and for all of the work that your staff is doing. Um, so I guess I just wanted to ask about uh, the NOAA uh, properties. So a couple years ago there was kind of this, um, well we were seeing a lot of NOAA properties get bought up, flipped, people were displaced. And so obviously the council at that time passed some policies like the 90-day um, tenant protection ordinance things like that, but I'm just curious, um, are we seeing that same level of interest in kind of the older NOAA properties and flipping them or are developers taking advantage of some of the incentives that we have in place now to help just kind of um, refurbish those properties and keep people in place? Just curious. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor, Council Member Carter for the question. So we are seeing some interest in the properties outside of Blooming Meadows South, which was our preservation project of preserving 306 homes and providing that funding. We have not had any other that I know of since I've been here. We have not had any other developers approach us about other properties that are NOAA. We have had properties in Bloomington that have sold, but we also have double checked and watched that and it was, they were not necessarily NOAA properties where we had a lot of residents at 60% AMI or below living there. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so just a, a question. I see that on the work plan for 2022, uh, we have uh, uh, kind of a uh, something around home ownership. I know that uh, Council Member Nelson and a number of other council members have been champions uh, of this home ownership. What I'm curious about is how do we how do we measure um, you know if we you know from from last year to this year and when we come back in a year from now uh, you know how do we how do we kind of move the move the dial on that uh, on that piece and and, and uh, what what discussions have been had um, around that and what's the thought the thinking around that for 2022. Thank you, Mayor Bussey, Council Member Lohman. Thank you for the question. So for home ownership, it's a few things. One, education. Um, providing the opportunity for different education around uh, home buying as well as home preservation. Working with our community partners, the council did approve funding for the Minnesota Home Ownership Center, and that is one of their um, larger programs that they provide the home stretch workshop, as well as foreclosure prevention. And so one, education. Two, we have our properties that the HRA does own, the 21 rental homes for future home buyers. That is the pathway to home ownership. What we have seen, um, even in the pandemic, is we have seen people that have bought homes from our project-based single family homes. So they moved from section eight to owning homes as well as um, the rental homes for future home buyers. What we're seeing though, is that Bloomington is a little too expensive for them to be able to stay here, which comes in the mortgage assistance funding that the council did approve. And so being able to provide dollars towards a purchase for 80% AMI or below households, that is not restricted. And what I mean by that is it can be matched. 
with other opportunities for down payment assistance. Um, also, what we're looking at is how can we help develop and create home ownership opportunities, affordable home ownership opportunities. So that's where talking with Habitat for Humanity, West Hennepin Affordable Housing Land Trust, Project for Pride and Living, these are all entities that have done work in Bloomington previously and provided affordable home ownership opportunities. Also, just working together regionally. We are on um, different groups and have different representation where Bloomington is at the table to have the discussions that not only are just in this region, but also are going up to the state legislature to ask for different um, opportunities and benefits to increase that. So to answer your question, Councilmember Lohman, it's both and. It is being able to provide the different resources and support the different resources provided, and then pr the tracking. So keeping track of people being able to purchase homes, where they're able to purchase homes, what's the down payment assistance is needed, which is a part of the mortgage assistance program that was approved by the council, to track who is using it, where are they using it in Bloomington, and how much do they need. That's going to be a very big deal, and as you know, that's a part of the racial equity business plan, is to provide, um, to track that information, collect, track, and report back out on that data. So it's all the things. Well, I'll look forward to uh, seeing how that, that measures up uh, from, from uh, this year to next year, and hopefully we'll, we'll be making progress on that because I'll, I'll, I'll ask the same question uh, uh, a year from now. Thank you, Council Member. I look forward to it. Council, additional questions? I'm not seeing hands go up, so this is not, we don't have to approve this. We just, uh, but uh, I do want to thank you for your work and pass our thanks on to your, your board and best of luck with your two new board members and let us know if you have any issues with them and we'll certainly work with them as needed. So thank you so much. Thank you. We will move on. Item six on our agenda is our consent business and council member Coulter has our consent agenda tonight. Council member Coulter. Thank you, mayor. And first of all, I should point out that I did previously serve on the HRA board, so I'm not nearly as much of a troublemaker as Councilmember Martin is. Um, I have heard of a hold on item 6.2. I have not heard of any other holds. Is that correct? Council additional holds? Mm -hmm. Not seeing anything here, so I think you're correct. All right, in that case, I will move item 6.1. And 6.3 through 6.17. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Coulter and a second by Councilmember Martin to accept the consent business as stated. Hearing no further council discussion on this, Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Item 6.2. Thank you, Mayor. Now, this is one that I wanted to hold. Um, just generally, I um, I wanted uh, to... Councilmember yeah. Coulter, you're, we're having a hard time hearing you. If you could get a little oh. closer to your microphone, it would be helpful, I think. Yep. Sorry about that. Can, Much better. Can Thank you. you. Okay. okay. Um, I'm just wondering, generally, if staff could sort of speak to what the ADA plan is, um, what it means for city government, what what residents can sort of expect to see from it. And I know um, Council Member D'Alessandro also wanted to hold it. I don't know if she had anything specific she wanted to raise or or any specific questions she wanted to ask. Thank you, Council Member Coulter. Um, my question was similar. I was just looking to see if there were, if somebody could highlight for us any of the major changes, if any. Um, I, I did notice that the survey results were updated and things like that, but I was wondering if there were any major changes to the plan as a result of the update. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Verbrugge? Uh Mr. Meyer and council members, I'm looking to see if we have Bob Simons with us. He's the one who's uh, in public works carrying this one. So let me just double check and see if Bob is here. I don't see uh, Bob on the call. I see uh, Mr. Keel jumping in here. Okay, go ahead, Carl, if you're there. Yes, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Keel. 
So I'll see if I can address the, uh, the, the basic questions. Uh, the city's ADA plan is composed of a number of different segments. Um, the one before you this evening has to do with uh, work within our right of way, which is primarily focused on sidewalks and trails and how they cross and, and connect with streets. We also have plans for facilities and for parks and recreation that I'm aware of and a general plan. Um, but those are not the item that are being talked about uh, this evening. Uh, the item this evening is again having to do with our trails and our sidewalks and probably the biggest component of that is to make handicap accessible uh, crosswalks and curb drops. Uh, and so the, the plan doesn't have any major substantive uh, changes other than it has updates for all the work that has been completed over the past five years. So all the numbers and the kind of goals have changed just because we've accomplished a fair amount uh, over the past five years. Uh, generally, we, we take care of, of uh, crosswalks and curb drops uh, as part of our pavement management program, which is a, a pretty effective way to go about that. Uh, generally speaking, we pay about $2,000 or so um, to remedy a, a curb drop as part of our pavement management program. Uh, if we were to do those separately, that would cost more than double that, about uh, $4,500 or so. So we found that this is a very good methodical and cost-effective way to go about uh, upgrading all of those. If that answered your questions? Um, Councilmember Coulter, answer your question. It did, yes. Councilmember D'Alessandro. I'm good, thank you, Mr. Keel. Any additional questions? All right, no additional questions. I'd look for a motion on item 8 point, uh, excuse me, uh, 6.2. Uh, Mayor, I can, excuse me, since um, I can handle that one, uh, except that I, I didn't want to pass it on my agenda, so just give me one moment. Uh, Mayor, I will move to approve the updated ADA Public Rights of Way Transition Plan. I'll second that. We have a motion by Councilmember Coulter, a second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to adopt item 6.2 on our consent business. Hearing no further council discussion, Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Moving on to item seven on our agenda, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances, item 7.1, which is a resolution authorizing issuance and sale of the general obligation capital improvement plan bonds series 2022A. Ms. Economy Scholler is here with us. Good evening, with Good evening a, Mayor and with Council. With a new improved microphone, I'm glad to hear. Well done. Yes, I love technology uh, and a new camera, so you have more, um, more of the library behind you. Very nice. Ms. So, I think she Mayor Council, the, the item, Raider, right? Excuse me. Yeah, we can see your slide. We're ready to go. Thank you. Okay, Mayor and Council, the, the item before you is uh, approval of General Obligation Capital Improvement Bond Series uh, 2022A. Uh, the city currently has uh, the three triple A's and has had all three triple A's since 2004. We are one of 40 municipal governments of more than 19,500 nationwide that have the three AAAs. Uh, we will be having our credit rating with Standard & Poor's for this bond issue on October, uh, excuse me, March 10th. Uh, this is a rendering of Fire Station 4. Uh, this uh, Fire Station has been serving uh, the community for over 50 years and uh, pretty much has exceeded its useful life. The station lacks adequate space for equipment and no longer meets the health and safety needs of the firefighters. The new fire station will be a two-story structure with a partial basement with a total square footage of just under 25,600 square feet. There will be three bays, office space, training room, living accommodations, and firefighter health and safety resources. Demolition is scheduled for early spring. There were a number of communications and 
community engagement opportunities for the Bloomington um, residents to participate with. There's been Let's Talk and a dedicated city page. There was informational tables in October, August, October, um, and one weekly um, projection updates. Just some of the other events that have happened in on May 10th of 20. 21, the council approved a reimbursement resolution. Uh, at that point, we had estimated about $10 million worth of cost. We do not need to do another reimbursement resolution um, as the soft costs spent to date are less than 20% of the project costs. In December, of, the council held a public hearing on the 2022 and-2031 CIP and provided preliminary approval to the issuance of all of the CIP bonds that were listed in the CIP. This evening, we are just centering on what is anticipated for 2022 for CIP bonds, and that is the fire station. Uh, the reverse referendum uh, period, which is a 30 day period of time uh, from once the council approved that to uh, 30 days into January, where residents could have um, petitioned for a, a referendum for this a vote for this one. We received no petition. Uh, the council approved 27 of the 29 bid packages on the 7th of February, and the last two bid packages were approved um, a few months ago. Um, so the, this evening, the only thing the council would need to do as we move through this would approve the resolution authorizing the sale of the bonds. The March 28th, we would have the sale of the bonds and then spring construction. Um, April 27th, we would have the receipt of the bond proceeds to start paying uh, contractors costs. So before the council th this evening, um, we have that um, Baker Tilly, our municipal advisor, has done a bond structure that includes uh, bond maximum is twelve million eight hundred thirty-five thousand. It is a twenty-year term, um, but, and because it's a little longer uh, duration than one you normally have for our payment management program bonds that we issue, or the park bonds, um, the interest rate is currently higher. At uh, current estimate, is two point eight seven. We're seeing um, changes in the marketplace. Um, inflation rates are, are moving things along the curve there. So um, hopefully we'll have good interest rates uh, a month from today. Project costs are still the 12,500,000 $12, and um, estimated financing in that 12,835 is $335,000 worth of financing costs. The largest piece of that is $281,000 of capitalized interest. Uh, again, depending on the interest rates at the time of sale, that um, capitalized interest could be as low as $250,000 and as high as $400,000. Um, capitalized interest then would be due on the debt service on February 1st of 2023. Um, and uh, I did include in um, for council questions today, um, a possible resource for the capitalized interest and um, staff is generally recommending uh, looking at either our, our fire pension fund, um, positive budget variance from 2021, or strategic priorities. Um, and so staff will be talking with the city manager uh, now that, and looking at what we can put before the council to pay that capitalized interest, which would bring our debt amount down. Our, our goal is always to issue the least amount of debt that we have to. So then before the council this evening are the two motion the, the motion to adopt the resolution. And um, should there be any questions, I'm available. I believe our municipal advisor, Terry Heaton's uh, also called in and possibly Julie Eddington, our bond attorney is available. Thank you, Ms. Economy Shoulder. Mm -hmm. Also questions on this. Any questions on the issuance of the bonds for Fire Station 4? Not seeing any hands go up or any discussion on this. So, Council, uh, if there are no questions, I would look for action on item 7.1. Mayor, I can make that motion. Council Member Martin. Uh, I move that we adopt the resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of general obligation capital improvement plan bonds series 2022A. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember Martin, a second by Councilmember D'Alessandro. 
to authorize the issuance and sale of general obligation capital improvement plan bonds, series 2022A. No further council discussion on this? Hearing none, Mr. Brillard. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. D'Alessandro? Aye. Loman? Um, I'll go ahead and vote. I just want to make sure this wasn't a public hearing at all. This is a resolution, an adoption of a resolution, so it is not a public hearing. Okay. Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Economy Scholler. Um, thank look you. forward to, to seeing you again at the end of the month, uh, the end of March, to see where the interest rate comes out on this one as we, as we look to have the bond sold. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Item 7.2 on our agenda is a public hearing. It's our only public hearing of the evening. And this is regarding 8200 Humboldt Avenue, considering the comp plan map, um, the comp plan map amendment rezone and the, the uh, prelim preliminary development and the final development plan. And I believe Mr. Centenario from our planning department is here to talk us through this one. Sam, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so as you mentioned, uh, the public hearing on tonight's agenda is for a redevelopment proposal uh, at 8200 Humboldt Avenue. And there are several elements uh, to the redevelopment. There's a comprehensive plan amendment uh, specifically to change the designation from an office land use to a high density residential land use. Along with that is a rezoning uh, to allow a, a multifamily uh, development. And then the preliminary and final development plans for uh, the four story 149 unit apartment building. Uh, so uh, the site that in question is uh, along Interstate 35W, uh, just south of 82nd Street. Uh, so <clears throat> you're likely familiar with uh, familiar with the site, maybe drive by it to and from work, uh, but it's a, the existing property uh, has a three-story uh, office building uh, that's more or less centralized in the site and then surrounded by uh, surface parking uh, on three sides. So this is a uh, one image of the site, uh, more or less the, the north portion. And then here is the, the southern uh, portion of the site. And then uh, this is looking from uh, 82nd Street South. And yet you can see to the left, the, the on-ramp to 35W. So it's an older office building and uh, you know, has seen better days. And uh, we are, uh, and tonight we're entertaining a, a proposal to redevelop the property. So the, uh, what I have on screen here are land use designations identified in the city's comprehensive plan. And you can see the A200 site uh, is in a purple, uh, which designates office land uses. And you can see across the interstate uh, to the east, we have uh, quite a few properties that are designated high density residential. So essentially the, what this proposal would do is more or less have a mirror image of, of what uh, the designations are uh, on the east side of the, of the interstate. Then you see that in the in the graphic here. This is what the, the designation would be uh, if approved. Now, along with comp plan amendments, we typically see a rezoning request, and, and that's the case here. Uh, currently, the site is zoned B1 or neighborhood office, so very much consistent with the three-story office use. Uh, but but to allow a high density residential uh, development, uh, we uh, would need a high density residential zoning district and the RM50 district is proposed. Uh, there is some flexibility that's being requested. Uh, so the plan development overlay uh, would be applied to the site. Now getting into the development plans uh, specifically, uh, we, you can see the, the site plan on the screen, a uh, four story apartment building that uh, really utilizes uh, like a, a courtyard style uh, uh, design where uh, the applicant is proposing to have the building located a little closer to Irving Avenue South uh, and I'll have a graphic on that in more detail, uh, but then have two courtyards along uh, Irving Avenue. Uh, so it breaks up the mass of the building along uh, the street. Uh, the, when we have land use transitions from high density to lower density, and in this case, single family homes to the immediately on the other side of Irving, we, we wanna be mindful of building mass and having those courtyards helps reduce that overall mass uh, for the single family homes. There are There is an affordability component uh, the code requirement or the in the opportunity housing ordinance would be 
14 units at 60% AMI or area median income affordability level. Uh, the applicant is proposing 14 units at a 50% uh, area median income, so slightly greater affordability uh, for this development. Here's a graphic that I, I mentioned, and this, this the intent of this is to demonstrate the area that where there's flexibility uh, versus area that is uh, area that is beyond uh, the minimum building setback. So the area in yellow, you can see the yellow rectangles, are the areas of the building that uh, are are within the minimum setback requirement. But then you can see as part of these courtyard uh, areas uh, in the green, those are beyond the minimum uh, setback requirement. So there is a deviation that's needed, but but we we believe that the overall impact uh, visually and from a massing standpoint is actually uh, a, this is very beneficial, and the percentage of building area along Irving Avenue that's beyond the setback is greater than the area that they're seeking out some flexibility. So we're, we're quite supportive of it. One of the elements that required some uh, modifications or tweaking along along the way was related to a retaining wall. Uh, there is some, <clears throat> certainly there is some grade on the site, especially on the east side uh, as you move towards the interstate. And we wanted to make sure that one, that there was no retaining walls in uh, MnDOT right of way, because uh, that, could, that could cause delays later on but that uh, there wasn't a, a really significant drop uh, that could be a potential safety hazard. Uh, so working with the applicant, they, they were able to, to figure that out where we have retaining walls that are less than uh, four feet in height. Uh, we have different setback requirements depending on how high the retaining wall is. Uh, so this does require a, a, a very modest amount of flexibility, uh, but it overall is, a, is an improvement from uh, the original proposal. And uh, we think overall uh, an improvement to the site plan. Along with that, when you when you tweak one thing in one location, then you might have you might uh, change something uh, in another location that requires some some further work, and that's the case in this graphic. When we have sidewalks directly next to parking stalls, we want to ensure that there's enough space to account for vehicle overhang, and that's usually two feet. Uh, so the total width of sidewalk, including the curb, should be seven feet when you have a parking stall right there. So there's, there's some uh, more tweaks that that. What we would work through with the applicant, uh, certainly not worried that uh, there are major issues. Uh, but again, when you make modifications in one area, it could impact another one and uh, just some additional work that has to happen. As, uh, as part of our normal process, we did notify uh, the Department of Transportation on the, on the plan, given their proximity to uh, Interstate 35W. They did have uh, no significant comments really, uh, but they did mention uh, some landscaping that is proposed in their right of way. So again, this area near the retaining wall uh, along Interstate 35W, the applicant was showing some uh, trees in MnDOT right of way, and that's not something that they they want to see. Uh, so that's one mod modification of the landscaping plan that would uh, have to occur um, uh, to make sure that all the landscaping that's required is on on the site. We always do a parking analysis uh, as part of redevelopment and. We also would incorporate the OHO incentive, uh, which does apply here, of course. And uh, when we look at the base code requirement, it's uh, based on the, the unit mix and the number of units for each of unit type. The total parking requirement is 298 stalls. And uh, the applicant is proposing 224. With the level of affordability that's being proposed, uh, they are, are enabled, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, there is a 30% reduction, overall reduction from the code requirement, which brings us to 200, 209 stalls. So the applicant is actually proposing 15 more stalls than uh, would, be would be required as part of the OHO incentive. And when asked about that, the, the answer is pretty simple. They, they feel that the 224 stalls is really what they need to, need to have on the site to adequately serve the development. So we have a few uh, building elevations. Here you can see a, a three-dimensional uh, rendering. And again, you can see the, the building located slightly closer to the street. Uh, no balconies were, are being proposed on that side. Again, being mindful of the visual impact to single family neighborhoods or single family homes on the west side of the street. Whereas if you have balconies, that's a further encroachment. Uh, and then, you know, you, if you're trying to, you know, sit in your family room, you might have the, <laughs> idea of someone looming in, looming over you, uh, looking in your family room. But uh, again, you can see the courtyard uh, design along, along the street. Another image, uh, 
before building permits are issued, we always review the detailed uh, building materials that are that are proposed. Don't anticipate any issues in this case. It's, it's a similar palette to what we've seen elsewhere between glass, metal panel, brick, uh, something that we've, we've seen and, and, and um, uh, work with on a regular basis. And again, one more image uh, showing the east uh, building elevation. So with that, we are recommending approval. We have several motions uh, for your consideration tonight. The first is for the comprehensive uh, land use plan designation, again, changing it from office to high density residential. Then along with that is the rezoning uh, ordinance, and then uh, a motion to approve the preliminary and final development plans. Uh, so I am available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Centenario. Council, questions on this? Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a quick question, and, and maybe it's just in the packet and I missed it, but um, those 14 uh, affordable units, do you know what the bedroom count is for those? How many are one bedroom, two bedroom, et cetera? Mr. Centenario? Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Member Coulter, I, I don't recall offhand. Uh, the intent is that uh, there's a mix, of course, where you don't have all 14 being studios or mostly studios and one bedrooms. I, you know, the, the applicant is here tonight. They may be able to, to identify what the, what the proposed mix is, uh, but I, I believe there's at least uh, several units per unit type uh, that would be affordable. Okay, I maybe at, at some point, I don't know if it's appropriate now, at some point I'd, I'd be helpful if the applicant could answer that question. I, I think we might have an answer for you, Council Member Coulter here and now. Good evening. Hi. Um, I don't know what the if, exact- If you could identify yourself so we have you for sure. the Sure, I'm Brian Bachman, I'm with the Enclave Companies. Um, I don't have the exact number, but basically what it does is it mirrors the 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 unit count. So if, if let's just say use easy math, 70% of our units are studios, um, they aren't, uh, but let's say they were, then there would be 9% of those units would, would be in the 50% AMI. If there's 10% of three bedrooms, then 9% of those would be the rest. So it just basically mirrors our, our unit mix through the whole project. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Council, additional questions. Not seeing any questions coming up. Not seeing questions, so what we will do now, I will open the public hearing. Let's open the public hearing on item 7.2, which is uh, regarding 8200 Humboldt Avenue. Uh, the public hearing is open. Is there anyone in the council chambers who wishes to speak regarding 8200 Humboldt Avenue? Jerome, is there anyone on the phone who wishes to speak to item 7.2 tonight? Uh, there is no one dialed in for item 7.2. You may continue. Thank you, Jerome. Last call for anyone in the chambers? Anyone perhaps outside overhearing the conversation? Waiting for a moment? Council, I see no one coming forward. I look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 7.2. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, a second by Councilmember Martin, to close the public hearing on item 7.2 this evening. No further council discussion on this matter. Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0, closing the public hearing. Council, any additional questions? Actually, Mr. Centenario, I, I do have one. Uh, just looking at um, the, the anticipated traffic for a, an apartment complex of this size compared to what the, the anticipated park or the traffic issues would be for, a, um, for an office that, of that size that's on the site now, and assuming that office was 100% occupied, which I don't believe 8200 is right now, how do those two compare? How, how, what do we... What do we do for a balance or what are we look at, looking at for a balance between what the current condition is and what the proposed condition might be? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as part of the redevelopment, uh, the city uh, actually conducted a traffic study. Um, and uh, I, I should probably defer to the traffic engineer uh, with the firm that, that conducted that study to, to answer that question more directly. 
So if I, I believe we have uh, someone from um, HDR uh, that's available to answer that question. Mr. Martinez, is that you uh, raising your hand? You may be on mute, Mr. Martinez. Yep. Yep. Can you hear me now? There we there we have you. Yes. Yeah, it's great. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor and, and uh, members of the council, thank you. Uh, and yes, uh, we did uh, conduct the traffic the traffic study. Um, and uh, I don't know that I can answer the the what what did the office uh, comparison uh, versus the proposed. Uh, looking back at the study here, but what we can say is that um, we did look at the uh, intersections surrounding the proposed development and each of the intersections uh, in the build scenario was uh, uh, shown to uh, expected to perform at a level of service A or better for five to six intersections um, at level of service B, which is the signalized intersection at 82nd and Knox. Uh, which is also a uh, non-congested um, uh, uh, level of service. Um, did that answer the question you were looking for? Uh, to a point. I, I mean, I'm glad to hear those that, that a study was done and those results were found. Uh, my question was just comparing the uh, apples to, I suppose, oranges, the one to the other, to see what the difference might be for the neighbors in the, in the neighborhood. But uh, if your if your response is that uh, the traffic study is showing that there won't be a significant or uh, harmful impact on the neighborhood, that's that's reassuring to me, and I think it's something I would. would you know, I, I, I did find, and you know, I wasn't. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Mayor and, and uh, uh, members of the council. I didn't uh, personally write the the report. I, uh, the person that wrote the report is no longer with HDR, so I, I'm I'm looking back on it, and I do see the uh, existing conditions of uh, results here. Um, again, uh, all intersections except for 82nd and Knox uh, were also shown to operate at level of service A. Um, at 82nd and Knox, the existing conditions. Um, operate at level of service A in the AM peak and level of service B in the PM peak. So the net difference is really only seen at 82nd and Knox where um, both inter, uh, both the AM peak and the B, uh, PM peak operate at level of service B, which again is uh, an uncongested uh, environment. And that answers my question. So thank you, Mr. Martinez. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, quick follow-up question to yours. Uh, was there any modeling done on the traffic based on proposed changes by MnDOT to the entrances and exits at 82nd? Um, at, uh, the short answer is no, just because we didn't know exactly what the MnDOT project would look like. Um, there was an attempt to look at it um, with a build scenario with future, future MnDOT project operational analysis results. And there again, um, taking what we knew of the MnDOT project at the time the study was written, um, the level of services at all intersections except for 82nd Knox still continued, to, still are expected to operate at level of service A. 82nd Knox uh, still is expected to operate at level of service B. But again, the the MnDOT project was was um, uh, you know not not quite as uh, developed as it is today, maybe. Um, and then, quick follow up on that: How much of the traffic is expected to head south on Irving up to 82nd versus heading north down to 83rd and try to connect? I think there's a frontage road there that you can take down and get on at 86th. Um, but how did that look? Because that'd be um, potentially more traffic through that neighborhood. Correct. Yeah. the The Humboldt Avenue itself would be closed, and traffic would would be rerouted. Um, looking back at the numbers here. Um, so, in the um, 
a.m. peak hour, um, we are looking at a, a very minimal traffic um, going down Knox. And the p.m. peak hour, I mean, we're, we're talking uh, 10, 11 vehicles. And the p.m. peak hour, we're up in the um, 75 um, uh, vehicles along Knox with the project. And let me see if I can compare us to uh, without the project here. Looks like I've got just the estimated 2021 and then, okay, oh yeah, here we go. So trip distribution and trip assignment. Um, very little of that traffic is actually going down Knox. The the overall development isn't adding um, significant difference. Looks like most of the traffic is going down Irving um, using the stop controlled intersection approach to uh, 82nd with nine vehicles in the morning and 26 in the afternoon, uh, whereas Knox, it's even less. It's uh, uh, almost negligible on, at Knox. Okay. Um, and then last question, knowing that we just got the Metro Orange line and it, it uh, goes right past that location. Am I correct in understanding that in order to actually utilize the Orange line, you'd have to go over um, 82nd West, go uh, north on Knox and connect up in the in that area, there wouldn't be a stop in nearby. I mean, right at that location, it would be a few blocks away up Knox. Is that accurate? That is correct. And uh, it's less than a quarter mile away uh, from the study area, uh, which is still accessible through a network of the local sidewalk system. Sure. Great. Thank you for helping understand the impact on that neighborhood and the transportation uh, requirements there. Appreciate the help. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilmember Nelson. Additional questions, Council? Mr. Mayor, I have a comment, not a question. Councilmember D'Alessandro, okay? comment. <laughs> Thanks. It's just an encouragement for the, the folks, the developers. One of the things we are, one of the questions that, that got answered for me when I asked some questions of staff earlier today was about um, what uh, you might consider in terms of uh, landscaping and things like that to understand the, the makeup there. Uh, I would encourage you to um, think about um, native plantings as much as possible, if including rain gardens and things like that. Um, there is a movement within that neighborhood. I happen to live at 86 and Emerson, so I'm, I'm in that neighborhood. Um, a movement within that to do a lot of work on native plantings and, and butterfly gardens and other things like that. And I think it would be enhancing to the city uh, if, if you all brought the scale of a development like this to, to bear on that. So more of an encouragement and I look forward to seeing the project. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I will say council, uh, as long as I have been in Bloomington, this project, this, this property has been in need. And that's a nice way of putting it. And I think uh, between the fact that it's been in need, looking at the proposed development with the affordable component, and looking at the uh, proposed development and its access to the orange line, I think this is, uh, this is a strong proposal here. And I think this is a, a great use of, the, of, the, of, of what is currently an underused parcel of land, I think, in the city of Bloomington. So I'll certainly be supporting this and, and can't wait to, to see it come up out of the ground. Councilmember Carter. Mayor, I just couldn't help myself. I will add to it. I drive by uh, this building almost every day. And so I'm very excited to see um, the proposal in front of us. And I also will be supporting it. Mr. Mayor, as you can tell, I'm also quite excited about this. Um, I, uh, I would say um, I was actually hoping it would be Taller, frankly, because and I was hoping there was going to be a coffee shop in the lobby. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, because I could walk there. <laughs> so uh, very, very excited. Thank you. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, well, I won't obviously oh. echo what what others have said. Um, this, as you put it well, this is this is a much needed project. Um, my one comment is that, um, as I have, have said before, um, you know, this this obviously does comply with the opportunity housing ordinance. Um, personally, I, I would have liked to see 
<clears throat> excuse me, uh, a little bit deeper of an, of an affordability level, uh, particularly given the the incentives I think that were requested. Um, obviously, I'm not going to expect that given the way the opportunity housing ordinance is currently constructed. Um, but I I think um, this is this is a case where where I I think we could have done more. I think this is good. I think we could have done better. Um, so I will I will be supporting it. But I did just want to make that comment. Thank you for that feedback, Councilmember. Councilmember Nelson, old hand or new hand? Uh, actually, a new one this time, Mayor. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, uh, thank you. I just uh, one thing. It's not germane to this. Sorry, my dogs. My dogs very upset about dinner time. Um, I just want to make sure that we reach out to the businesses that are officed in that building to see what we can do to help them if they need to relocate. And I would love to keep those companies here in, in Bloomington. Thank you, Councilmember Nelson. I guess it's worth the question. Uh, do we know where the displaced businesses will be ending up? Uh, they all know, obviously, that this is happening, but basically we've not done anything with them to give them official notices and everything as we do that. Um, this is really similar to what we did in, in our Richfield project where we had an older building that had to go, and um, we did work with the city. We worked with, every, with the individual people to try to keep them in Bloomington. Um, I would be pretty surprised if, I mean, there's not, A, there's not a whole lot of people left in the building. Um, but no, the hope is to try to keep as many of those folks in, in town as possible. And I would hope so. And, uh, and Mr. Sable is right down at the end of the table here, and he'd be happy to talk to you and share his card with you. And once we get to that point, uh, he'd be happy to help in any way if we can find a place for those folks who are still there. And I understand there are not a lot of folks still in that building, but let's, uh, let's do what we can do. Yeah, no, we, we put them together with our, with our marketing team and our, um, our brokerage team to try to kind of match them up as to, you know, what they need for space and, um, try to find them space that's similarly priced similar areas as best we can. So good. That sounds good. Thank you. Councilmember Nelson, answer your question. Good. Thank you. Council, unless there is anything else on this, I would look for action on, on item 7.2. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would move to adopt a resolution approving a comprehensive land use guide plan amendment to re-guide 8200 Humboldt Avenue South from office to high density residential. Second. Motion by Councilmember Carter, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to adopt the resolution approving a comp land use guide plan amendment to re-guide 8200 Humboldt Avenue South. No further council discussion on this? Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Loman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Councilmember Carter. I would move to adopt an ordinance rezoning 8200 Humboldt Avenue South from B1 Neighborhood Office to RM50 PD High Density Residential Planned Development. Second as well. Council, uh, a motion by Councilmember Carter, a second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to adopt the ordinance rezoning 8200 Humboldt Avenue South. No further council discussion. Mr. Brillard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Loman. Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. And Councilmember Carter? I would move to approve preliminary and final development plans for a four-story, 149-unit apartment building located at 8200 Humboldt Avenue South, subject to conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Second. Motion by Councilmember Carter, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro for preliminary and final development plans for uh, 8200 Humboldt Avenue South. No further discussion. Mr. Brillard. Carter? Aye. Coulter? Aye. D'Alessandro? Aye. Loman? Aye. Martin? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. Well, congratulations. Thanks for sticking it out. I appreciate your sticking through all the sausage making that we did earlier and all the uh, information. If I could just ask timelines here, when, when can we expect. Uh, uh, a pile of rubble, and, and then when can we expect a hole in the ground starting to be filled in? We're just uh, finishing up plans, so the goal would be to get those in. Um, we're going to take advantage of the um, expedited permit process as part of that. 
um, so that we can do hopefully get through that part while we're waiting for the comp plan amendment to go. Uh, the goal will be to get this started right away this summer. Very good. Well, thank you so much, and really want to thank uh, the city staff. Has been super with this. This has been kind of a long road to to get through this, um, but they've been super to work with and very supportive. So always really love to hear all. that. Love to hear that. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Good luck. Thanks. Jerome, that will do it for the public comment opportunities for our council meeting. So you can leave us this evening. Thank you so very much for your work. It's my pleasure. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item eight on our business, uh, or on our agenda, the organizational business of the evening. And item 8.1 uh, is an informational update and an opportunity for discussion on the I-494 visual quality process uh, that is going on. Uh, as everybody knows, we've got a lot of work planned for 494 in the very near future, and there has been a group uh, who, that has been working trying to make sure that it's not just, uh, it's not just another freeway run, that there's actually some visual amenities to the whole project, that it, uh, it looks good and it, it feels like the community. And we've got a, we have a number of folks who have been involved in that, in this, in the community uh, and with the city of Bloomington. Uh, I believe Amy Ron, our engineer, from our engineering staff, there she is, she's gonna lead us through this, but I know that uh, uh, Ms. Palenka's back and I think we have a representative from MnDOT as well joining us. So, good evening, whoever's gonna kick this off, take it and run with oh. it, go ahead. All right, thanks, Mr. Mayor, and thanks for the introduction on the item. Um, so the last update that we that I presented for 494 project was actually um, back in November, and that was when we held a public hearing um, and the council approved municipal consent for project one of the 494 airport to highway 169. Since that time, the projects um, continue to be developed and um, is still on track for construction to begin in the year 2023. Um, the focus, one of the focuses right now has been on developing a visual quality plan that will help guide the aesthetic elements for the corridor. Um, there's a visual quality committee that's been put together, as Mayor Bussey mentioned, and he's one of the representatives on that group. And so a lot of work has taken place. Um, Lisa Austin with MnDOT and Carl Weisenborn, with, who is the, one of MnDOT's consultants with SEH, are going to lead us through the presentation on um, what's been done, some of the elements of that um, visual quality manual, as well as another framework document called the Context Sensitive Solutions Framework. So they're going to go into that. And then at the end, I have just a couple additional slides to help spur some conversation, um, but we're not looking for any decision making at tonight's meeting. So I am going to hand it over to Lisa at this time. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Austin. Welcome. Uh, is Amy's? Oh, it just got muted. Nope, you are back. We hear you. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Thanks. I the little message popped up that said that the host muted you, so I, I'm glad I, I'm glad you can still hear me. Um, so uh, as Amy said, I'm Lisa Austin with MnDOT. I'm the project manager for the Visual Quality Manual and the Context Sensitive Solutions Framework. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to go through these slides fairly quickly so we have plenty of time for questions at the end, but I want you to have all the information for your records. So first I'll just kind of cover the process that we go through. So the Visual Quality Advisory Committee has been meeting every few weeks since last fall. Um, this includes staff and elected and appointed um, representatives from all the local governments along the corridor and some citizen reps. Um, there's about 45 people total on the committee and the meetings have been very well attended. In addition to uh, the advisory committee, we are also going out to the public at three points along the process. We uh, uh, did a, a set of engagement in the December, January timeframe and uh, in February, and right now we've just launched our third phase of public engagement. Um, and our consultants, SEH, um, are, work, are the landscape architects, and we've also hired, SEH has hired Forecast Public Art as a subconsultant to help with some of the engagement and the creative process. And I I believe Forecast has done some work in Bloomington before, so they're familiar with um, the, the community. Um, and the, the final deliverables will be this visual quality manual and the context sensitive solutions framework. I've got some slides that go into the details of those a little bit more. Um, so the visual quality manual is a typical thing with major MnDOT projects. Um, you know, it, it, 
it shows the architectural elements that'll be put on the infrastructure. So things like the railing design and the wall textures and the pier designs. So all of the architectural elements and then some um, uh, details about what the landscaping will look like. Um, and then the context sensitive solutions framework is kind of the other things that um, cover public art and placemaking and and how the project integrates with the adjacent land uses and a lot of the things that are in here are things that can be added later after the project is done um, so that's why there's two guides one is what MnDOT will build as part of the project and then the second one is opportunities that um, maybe can be added later uh, MnDOT can't allow you know what we call non-highway uses on our right away so things like public art so we're trying to define where those things might go um, uh, in the project so the visual quality process has three phases um, the the first is to decide what's important to the community. The second is then the landscape architects try to draw what those important values are. They turn those words into pictures. And then in phase three, we pick one um, aesthetic theme and apply that to the various parts of the corridor. Um, so in that phase one, uh, we did a lot of engagement, um, pop-ups at farmers markets, uh, uh, an online survey, a virtual listening session, and then lots of flyers distributed to um, some of the locations right adjacent to the corridor. Um, and the questions that were asked were, you know, for people, what, how, do, how would you describe your community? And you can see from this word cloud, um, the bigger the word is, the more often we heard that response. So a lot of words that relate to people, you know, friendly, people, love, you know, those are services, you know, those are all kind of people related things. There's also a lot of words that relate to, to the um, natural environment, parks, trails, nature, um, uh, lakes, you know, things like that. So um, the Visual Quality Advisory Committee came up with three themes, you know, using those different words. One was, you know, all the natural things, clear sky, green spaces, blue water. Um, the other theme they called people make the place because the people and the culture and the diversity was really important and then um, the other theme was you know connections and connecting and connectivity and you know some of the bridges over 494 are connecting people and then just the location of of the communities along 494 connect people to things so uh, then the landscape architects got to try to draw what those things mean and at first they came up with 12 concepts um, for the visual quality advisory committee to look at and discuss these are just little snapshots of what those looked like and the committee narrowed it down to four um, so the before i go in and show you those four finalists um, we we wanted to show people what's existing in along 494 you probably recognize these textures they've been used on um, retaining walls and bridge abutments um, for you know 20 or more years and some of these will be in place for some time into the future because you know some of that you know, infrastructure is brand new so this will be still existing in the corridor for a while um, along with uh, uh, places where we have sort of a standard dot railing that we use um, uh, along pedestrian facilities. So then on to the four finalists. One of them um, was called Winds and Waves, and you can see it has kind of wavy texture with uh, a little bit of those vertical stripes. Um, and then another one was uh, more organic. Uh, this one they nicknamed Sunrise and Sunset. Um, Another uh, option was lake beds, you know, kind of taking the depth um, drawings of uh, lake uh, lake maps. Um, and then the last one was uh, we nicknamed Reverb. So those were the four finalists. And we went out to the public again and asked them what they thought of the concepts, you know, if they could imagine them in along 494 and, and if they reflected the community. This time, um, we had an amazing amount of participation. We had the a listening session where people attended and asked a lot of questions. We had about 400 people um, stop at the pop-up events and a thousand survey responses. So quite a robust um, uh, response from the communities along the corridor. And, you know, with lots of good comments, you know, the lake beds, winds and waves and sunrise, sunset were preferred. People didn't really like reverb. Um, uh, People talked about wanting something that re reflected the community in Minnesota. Um, you know, lots of questions about, you know, kind of the 
and you know is it gonna are they worried are we worried about graffiti and some of the other you know um practical things about the 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 designs and uh the finalist to the chosen the theme is lake beds and that was in all the forms of public engagement it was always the favored one you know the sunsets the other two or too far behind, but Lake Beds was definitely the most popular choice of the public. And people really felt like it reflected the community in Minnesota, you know, better than the other designs. The other designs really could be anywhere, but, you know, Minnesota is known for its lakes and rivers and water. So, the, so Lake Beds is what we're moving forward with. And now the landscape architects are tasked with the um, challenge of deciding where to put this and working the details out of how it, you know, how it'll be reflected in, in the different areas. Um, this is a, a, a concept for the railing design. So it kind of picks up the, the lines of the lake beds and puts them on railings. So um, uh, that's the lake beds. And then just to acknowledge, we did hear a lot of people ask questions about what the noise walls would look like. So the noise walls on the highway side We'll have um, areas where we have the lake bed pattern. And then on the community side, they can have um, a, a nice rock texture. So it looks like a stone wall. Um, and then, you know, in areas where there's um, earth, there can be plantings, you know, tall grasses or pollinators or vines climbing up the, the retaining walls but for the noise walls. Uh, but we just want to acknowledge that that was a question people asked is what the what the community side of the noise wall would look like. Um, so uh, the next question a lot of people ask is what is this cost? So MnDOT has a budget for aesthetic elements um, in projects and we pay, you know, we have a like a, you know, you know, our guidance says, you know, we can pay up to 7% of the cost for a bridge can go towards aesthetics and 5% of the cost of a retaining wall can go for aesthetics. And so we'll pay 100% of the aesthetics up to those maximum amounts. And what we're doing is proposing uh, ways to apply that lake beds pattern that fits within MnDOT's budget. Um, if, there, if communities want any additional treatments, they can contribute additional funds. You know, so if like, for example, in that railing design where we had um, the lake beds waves, you know, we might put it in some spot locations along the railing, but if a community wanted it to be applied along the whole thing, you know, they might opt to uh, pay a little bit extra. And we're still working out exactly the costs and, and the proposed, um, design will fit within MnDOT's budget and uh, then communities can decide later um, if they want more of the aesthetics applied. Um, so this is just, you know, some of the things that um, fall under the category of what uh, qualifies for MnDOT's cost participation. So, you know, the textures in the walls, the pavement colors, the railings, the pier designs, you know, all the elements, the, all the architectural elements that are on, on projects. Um, what falls outside of our cost participation policy is primarily artwork, you know, um, both the state and federal transportation money that we receive is not, it doesn't have art as an eligible um, expense, uh, but we can allow art on our right of way. And so that's again, why we're you know putting together that context sensitive solutions guide so that we can identify places where people might like to see artwork. You can see on Hastings, there's a really nice mural underneath the bridge there and, and uh, the, the Hastings added that later. Um, in that case, that's a, a mosaic type mural, but murals could be painted, you know, there could be sculptures. There's lots of examples of artwork that um, cities have added to MnDOT projects. Um, yeah, I think that covers the, the art has to, you know, the local government needs to be the sponsor of the art. They can have sub agreements with others that maybe pay and maintain it, but um, we, we work with the local governments to be the sponsor of the artwork. And then um, landscaping, the visual quality manual will identify what the landscaping will look like on the project. The landscaping is a is a separate budget and is done a couple years after the project is complete, just so that we can make sure that it you know gets established and get trampled when you know the project is getting finalized. So a couple of years after the project is done, we'll come back and do some landscaping uh, around the area. So. Um, the rest of the schedule, we've got a 
about a month to finish things up. Um, we're currently doing the public engagement, like we said, March tomorrow night is a listening session and we've got a survey that'll be live for uh, about 10 days. And then the advisory committee meets two more times and we're finishing up the manuals by the end of March. So it'll be uh, ready for the design build bid package that is going out after that. Um, so with that, that's all I have and we can certainly answer questions. Well, thank you. Thank you for the update. And I was, uh, I was wondering what won, what the final winner was. <laughs> so it was. Good to see lake beds. Glad to see that. Council, questions, comments on this? So you said that uh, the, the cost estimates for, for any kind of add-on a local government would want to do, you'd have that in the future. Any idea what the timeline would be on that or or just a, a ballpark, I mean, for an extra railing or for additional, you know, uh, something on sound walls and anything along those lines, just as a, a general idea. So I'm going to see if Carl, do you have an estimate of when we'll be, you know, the, the probably mid March is when we'll be um, putting more detailed designs together and you'll have an idea um, for for what fits in our budget is do you can you add some details to that carl carl yeah can folks hear me yes we can okay thank you um the a high level cost estimate would be part of the vqm process um i mean it's we're looking at square foot costs of different noise wall treatments and we're working with one of the fabricators to give us guidance and insight to uh what the costs are for you know, they're standard. What's the cost for uh, a, a form liner that is has to be made custom for lake beds? And then a couple different options of one form liner, three form liners, or potentially 12 form liners to create the uh, the lake bed concept. So we're we're going to have a number of of, of cost information. Um, it is absolutely supplemental to the VQM. It was it I would call it at a early or high level. Um, it's not as specific as the cost estimating that will come out and be part of integral to the design build process as that pro process kicks off. So we'll have a, we'll have some fairly good, but I would call them high level estimates in the next month or so. So that'll all be included in the visual quality manual when it's done at the end of March. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Great. All right. And, and I appreciate that. And I wouldn't hold you to any, Total that you would throw out, but I was just trying to get, figure out, I mean, is it $100,000? Is it $10 million? Just trying to figure right. if, if we were looking at possibilities, what that might be. But understand, we'll wait for the end of March when the, uh, the, uh, the guidelines come out. Councilmember Lohman, question? Well, more so just a comment, Mayor, uh, just how much I appreciate this. I, I was just thinking about uh, something I had read about how uh, you know, we're looking to try to find innovative ways of trying to keep salt um, off our roads uh, because of the impact that it has uh, with the environment. And I just to think about uh, having uh, this here, it's kind of a, uh, you know, using artwork as a reminder for us um, around sustainability and that type of thing. And some of the other sustainable practices that we're going to follow uh, with some of the walls, uh, just glad to hear that and glad to, to kind of see that. And so I just wanted to comment how much I appreciated the, the, the thought that has kind of gone into this. I know that uh, uh, these things are not cheap and um, uh, so anything we can do to kind of make a mark um, and kind of send a message, uh, it's just much appreciative. And I just, uh, I like the way that this is coming together. Thank you, Council Member Lohman. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Quick question. I'm just wondering if there will be any space reserved for any type of um, City of Bloomington um, signage, logo type stuff, similar to the 35W Bridge. Um, is that part of the plan at all? 
Um, so I can answer that right now. What that's that's some of the questions that are being asked of the public right now is what they'd like to see in in different areas. So beyond just where they'd like to see the lake beds theme applied, you know, where might they like to see a bench or where would they like to see interpretive signs? So sign signage is definitely part of it. So I, I expect that we'll get some people wanting some, you know, um, local as localized signs and then that'll be part of what uh, gets put into the context sensitive solutions framework and into the visual quality manual where there could be places for um, city signs. Thank you council member. Thanks for the answer. Council anything additional? Mr. Mayor, if there's no additional questions from MnDOT, um, I'd like to share just a couple of um, slides with some questions just to just to make sure that we are um, that the staff that's participating in this process is um, best representing kind of the council's goals. And so it's just a couple of quick questions. Um, first of all, is that it's you know, it's been several years since we kind of initially talked about uh, visual quality on this corridor and I just wanted to confirm now that we have a new council member and just, just since it's been you know about three years down the line that there that there still is you know council interest and general support in moving forward and developing the these aesthetic elements and kind of creative place making opportunities along the corridor to build both build with the project and to kind of set up for the city to move forward to build in the future. I'm mostly just looking for like a head nod of support or if there's any questions on that. Well, Council, we'll ask the question or I mean, you can answer, I guess, with a head nod or anything beyond that, but is there still Council support for this type of thing to uh, to enhance this this uh, corridor 494, the rebuild? Council Member Carter? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I will admit either it was long enough ago that we had this conversation that I don't remember or it was before even I was on council. And so I guess I'm just curious um, as we think about the local contribution, have staff been planning for that? So as we've forecasted in our budget, like we've been preparing for this to come um, or would this be a new ask uh, that, that, that we maybe weren't planning for necessarily? That, that, that's a good question. And it kind of ties into the, the, the general question that I have of what What's the, what, what's the ballpark we're talking about here? Uh, Ms. Marone, do we, have we been building this into budgets or what, uh, what would a possible funding source be or have there been plans made for this potential, uh, for potential enhancements to this corridor? Mr. Mayor and Councilmember Carter, that's a really good question. So I know in engineering, there's been some placeholders in the budget through the years, just in, anticip in anticipation of this project and upcoming cost shares throughout the project. Now, there's already a pretty significant chunk of cost share that's been identified in the project, um, you know, even for, you know, just our share of some of the bridge reconstructions and, and different elements, um, some sidewalks, some, some trails. So we, I think, would have to, we'll have to come back. And that is definitely the type of questions that I was anticipating would come up. But we can come back um, with what those estimates are right now and what the city um, engineering budget is, has been carrying to cover those and then what would be additional. I don't believe that we really have um, intentionally identified like uh, for the creative placemaking and the artistic elements, um, which is kind of that separate framework that could be a follow, that could be follow up projects. And I do want to stress that um, there is just a really a lot of valuable value in developing that plan in that um, it it will give us the opportunity to kind of help reserve locations for right away, make sure that um, things don't get dropped in with the project in a location that everybody has said, oh my gosh, we really, you know, we really want to see benches and some type of artistic elements in this location. That's kind of, in my mind, the, the big value of having that framework is just as placeholders, if nothing else. Um, but yeah, we can definitely bring back some cost estimates in the next couple of weeks as they start to to get some of that information available as, long, as well as the um, cost share that we're anticipating for the rest of the project. I, I think the, uh, and council, uh, give me the thumbs up or thumbs down on this. I think the general consensus might be that the council still has interest and general support in developing the aesthetic elements here. But I don't think it's a, uh, it's not a blank check and say, go and 
we'll just do whatever we think. I, th I think it would have to come back and we'd have to th consider the cost implications on probably a suggestion by suggestion basics to try and figure out what would fit and, and where the funding would come from. Council, is that an accurate thought there? I think I'm seeing thumbs up. So I think that is kind of the general consensus of that to answer that question. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, uh, Council Member D'Alessandro. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Just as a, an added thought on that, um, to the extent that there are um, uh, materials available as a result of the construction itself that could be used in that kind of creative placemaking and things like that, where you actually can reduce the cost of it by using materials that otherwise would end up in a landfill or something to that effect. I would highly encourage the MnDOT folks in the and the city to work on that. Um, we have uh, an, no shortage of incredible welders and uh, and fabricators and and all kinds of you know real artisans in the Twin Cities area um, who could take uh, that kind of material and do something very cool with it, and it would reduce the overall burden of cost in the project. And it would also be a little nod to sustainability in my head, <laughs> as always. Uh, but I, I would encourage that, and so I throw that out there as an idea for a way to maybe mitigate some of those costs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my next set of questions had to do um, we just, I just want to make sure that, um, you know, as you looked at these different elements that were presented, were there any visual quality or context sensitive elements that really jumped out that you see as number one priorities? Um, and Council Member Nelson, I know you already asked the question that I was thinking may come up as well as, um, you know, we've heard, we had heard earlier that there's definitely an interest in doing some type of uh, city branding or some city monuments of some type. So I was, Curious to see if that would come up tonight as a priority, as well as any other items that kind of jumped out. Also, anything missing here? Anything that doesn't fit? Council Member D'Alessandro. Mr. Mayor, I've, I voted for lake beds, so I'm in good shape <laughs> as it relates to that. Um, uh, no, I think I think um, it's a great opportunity for us to, to ask the public, I think, uh, on that front. Candidly, um, you know, we we have kind of started a bird thing with the goldfinch. Maybe people have points of view on that. I actually look at our logo and I always see a bird first. It's weird, but you know, so there's uh, there's really cool opportunities I think for the city to weigh uh, the city residents to weigh in on that front. Yeah, thank you. I will say in the general discussion of themes, uh, I was a big advocate for the the notion of connecting and connections because uh, on a variety of different levels, I, I think it was mentioned in the presentation, the connections, the bridges across 494, but just the notion of connect along 494 and the notion of just generally connecting the community and for that, for that matter, all of Minnesota in a lot of different ways. Uh, we, we've heard how many different times that how used 494 is on a daily basis by people from across the state of Minnesota. So it connects us in a lot of different ways there as well. So um, I, I'll, I'll advocate for that again, if there's a way that we could somehow uh, merge lake beds, connecting communities somewhere in that, I don't know, something along those lines. Um, it, uh, it always appealed to me. It always, it always resonated to me as uh, something that this project could, could really uh, bring forward. All right, thank you. And last of all, is just a question of what other information are you, are you, do you, what other questions do you have as far as what types of elements are you looking for? And, and I'm already hearing um, a little bit more information on what are some of the rough estimate costs um, that may be asked of the city as we start looking at these elements. And as soon as that information's available, I'll, I'll be bringing that to you. Is there anything in addition to cost that you're interested in? getting more information on before we bring the final plan to the council? Well, I think uh, beyond cost even uh, are options. And I think we've talked about a couple of things. I mean, Council Member Nelson talked about city signage. Um, and I think he's thinking the the entrance monuments that we're, we've talked about on uh, the 35W bridge. 
I mean, is that even a, an option here? I've heard a couple of people mention benches, and honestly, I can't picture how a bench would work within this this kind of thing, unless it's you know making its way more on a city street. Or I I, I would I would ask for a, a list of options. What are possible? Is it lighting? Is it rain? You know, railings? Is it signage? Is it uh, what is it? I I look for possibilities, options, and and. Uh, as I've said in a number of different instances, uh, there, there's no, you know, there's no limit here. Throw out ideas and see if see if they stick. See if what, whatever we might have as as possibilities. I think we'd consider it. We'd at least talk about it, depending on applicability and cost and if it works. I don't know. Councilmember Lohman. So when you say that, I I thought I heard um, during the presentation that I believe it was Hastings that added some items later on. And I'm just curious what items, if we're looking at options, could be added later on, kind of as a, you know, a refresher, you know, 10 years later, or um, some things that uh, may be pricey now and that we decide we were going to add later. I'd be curious to know a little bit more about what options we have in that regard. Yeah, that's a good point. And we don't know what we don't know, I think, in a lot of cases here. So what, however you can guide us or lead us would be helpful. Would you like me to answer a little bit of that, or that if you if you have something okay. you can answer right now, that'd be great. Yes. Sure, sure. So, um, and I'll just talk a little bit about like places that a bench might go. You know, where the Chicago, the new Chicago Avenue Ped Bridge, there'll be some green space at both places where the bridge lands on either side. So that's the kind of area that you know could be good for a bench. You maybe somebody that's walking, you know, needs to sit down and rest, an older person or somebody with a disability that can walk but still need can't walk so far. So th that's the kind of places that a bench might make sense. Um and then as far as adding um you know artwork the the Hastings bridge they added the mural underneath the bridge on the wall of the bridge underneath and so things like murals could be added later or sculptures adjacent to um you know part of the um you know in the mindots right away but you know uh, uh, uh alongside next to the the project there's even a the, the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board has a play structure on a little bit of Mindot right away, right next to 35W at 28th Avenue. So, you know, there could be spots where there's um, green space that the, we could lease the lease the land to uh, a, a public or private partner that wanted to put something on the right of way. So that's the kind of thing that could be added later. And, you know, sometimes these things takes years. There's a there's a uh, a similar context sensitive solutions guide that you know was written 10 years ago and now we're finally going back and putting some artwork on the bridge piers um, that were identified in that plan so they, they can be useful for a long time um, I hope that helps that is helpful thank you it, it gives it, it opens up the possibilities I hadn't thought of a play structure in, in a green space so that's a good possibility too any more op, any more options that you can think of or, or offer to us happy to hear them happy to consider. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Just two quick things. Um, one, the play space made me think of this, but is there any testing for lead in the area around those? Because it's my understanding that there's significant lead pollution a lot of times near freeways due to, you know, previously when there was lead in gas and that it's still existing there if it hasn't been remediated. Um, and then my second thing in terms of the visual, which is what we're actually talking about. Um, the uh, um, one thing I'd be interested in is lighting and things like that. If there was a way, I know um, the Minneapolis uh, bridge over uh, the river there, the Mississippi, they they changed the lighting for different things. And I'd love to light it up all purple right after the Vikings win the Super Bowl next year. So, um, you know, if there's options, I know the bridges won't be there by next year. So we'll have to wait till they win it a second time. But, um, you know, that type of thing, I think, would be uh, of interest to me. Agree on the lighting. I think the lighting is a definite possibility, especially with LED lighting. Now they can do just about anything, and it can look really cool. I agree with that. Uh, for anybody on the project, uh, his uh, Councilmember Nelson's first question about uh, lead or lead abatement or lead testing in the area. So my colleague Amber Blanchard's on the um, call here too. I don't know if she can answer the questions about soil testing. I know we do a lot of that for projects, but I don't know if you know anything about this one in particular, Amber, or if this is something we need to get back to 
I'm yeah, on. I can. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, the we are right in the middle of a, what we call a phase two testing for contamination. Lead is part of that, uh, as well as other um, fuel sources and types of. Uh, oil-based products. So uh, we're about halfway. We've got some more drilling we need to do here in the spring, and then we'll have a comprehensive report after that. Thank you. Council, any other ideas popping up while we're sitting here brainstorming a bit here? Mr. Mayor. Council Member D'Alessandro. Uh, there, there is all, as you think about a Chicago and the Ped Bridge, the other one is Xerxes. So Xerxes is uh, oftentimes, um, it's quiet c compared to it for an overpass. It's not super busy and it affords itself because of its, the way that it spans open on both sides to a lot of really interesting opportunities for walkability. Getting to and from Centennial Lakes is through that area is very easy to do. Um, and so, uh, you know, partnering with Edina on some of the ideas for that would be pretty cool. Now I understand that we're not necessarily changing a lot on Xerxes, but there is opportunity and there's space for some, some cool um, ideas. Agreed. Council Member Martin. Thank you, Mayor. A apologies, it's just a quick question um, if this was mentioned, but in terms of these projects or cost sharing, how much coordination do we need to do with the city of Ridgefield in terms of how some of these connecting bridges are? improved i think a lot of that coordination is already underway um but i'll defer to the folks who are actually doing it to say exactly where we are in terms of coordination with the bridges that are going to go between bloomington and richfield uh mr mayor and council member um council member martin yeah there are, there's um coordination going on uh, coordination meetings twice a week with that Richfield is very actively involved with. So um, the cost share is actually um, the agent local agency cost share with MnDOT. So we won't necessarily be cost sharing like with Richfield, but um, the cost share goes directly between the local agencies to MnDOT. Um, there's a, a lot of discussions and coordination that's been going on. If you're talking about um, the specifics as far as bridge railings, um, that is something that we will just continue to be involved in working closely with them. And it'll kind of, we'll, I'll be taking the lead after we have our discussion about cost, um, costs, local agency costs, sorry, kind of jumbling this a little bit, but um, we'll be bringing that back to the council and also working closely with Richfield to find, figure out what the what their desire, desires and um, priorities are as well. Thank you. Council, unless there's anything else, any other ideas or thoughts? Seeing none, uh, thank you. Thank you all for uh, the presentation and the information and uh, look forward to additional information on this and uh, glad to see that this is part of the overall discussion because it's, uh, it, it's a big project and it's going to be around for a while and I want to make sure that if we're going to do this, let's do it in, in a way that's uh, th in the right way and done well and that we can, uh, we can all live with it for a long time. All right? Thank you. Thank you all much. Item 8.2 on our agenda is an update on our earned sick and safe leave process and consideration discussion that we've been having. Uh, I think Mr. Sable, Mr. Sable, and I believe Peter Zuniga is here as well to talk us through this. Um, uh, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Give me just a moment to um, change roles for some of the previous presenters, if I can. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, uh, Mike Sable, Assistant City Manager for the City of Bloomington. On uh, January 3rd of this year, the City Council heard a presentation from the Earn Sick and Safe Leave uh, Task Force. And uh, at that time, we heard from the Task Force member, uh, Nat Anderson Lippert, gave a presentation of kind of the summary of the conversation from the Task Force. Uh, and one of the suggestions at that uh, meeting was to make sure that we had a presentation to the Advisory Board of Health to uh, gain the, their in, uh, input and so it was another opportunity for community engagement and on February 22nd, um, 
Kate Ebert, Peter Zuniga, and I presented before the task force, and actually uh, Kate did the overwhelming majority of the work and did a, a terrific job. And the Advisory Board of Health uh, really provided some uh, more general uh, comments, but was very positive about the direction that this Earn Sick and Safe Leave task force was headed, and they t uh, talked about some of the benefits uh, to the community and notably the, the staff who would be impacted by uh, such a change. Um, this is the second time this item has come before the City Council in a formal manner, and this is really trying to get some clarity on direction for what we would consider to be a uh, so final preparations for a, a proposed draft ordinance. Uh, just to give some context um, in terms of timing, uh, if there is a consensus direction that is given tonight, uh, city staff and, and Peter Zuniga would prepare a, uh, uh, an ordinance for consideration that would be published in the newspaper on March 10th. There would, or I'm sorry, be prepared on March 10th. It would be published on the 17th, and then would be up for consideration for final approval at uh, the March 28th uh, City Council meeting. And some of the items that are still outstanding for um, direction from the from the City Council, uh, specifically relates to how we to treat um, seasonal employees. I think there was a. a a point of contention for the task force that wasn't resolved. And I think there are some other items and I'm going to actually um, ask Peter Zuniga to again sort of just generally walk through the structure of the uh, ordinance as it was originally drafted and then open up for the uh, discussion from the city council on sort of the outstanding uh, items that are there. So, Peter. Good evening, Mr. Zuniga. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, so, like we discussed uh, on January 3rd when we met, uh, the structure of the ordinance really starts with our findings and purpose. Uh, why are we doing this and what do we hope to accomplish with this ordinance? Uh, you know, staff and the task force really approach this from the, the public health perspective. And Kate Ebert and our public health team uh, really did a great job of trying to lay out the reasons why uh, this makes sense for the city of Bloomington do, to do from a... <clears throat> excuse me, from a public health perspective. Um, then we get into what I call kind of the legal requirements, you know, um, you know, things that we think are important to address, you know, if any portion of the ordinance is held unconstitutional or invalid, uh, so severability, so we can keep the remaining legally valid portions of the ordinance intact. Um, we had uh, previously talked a little bit about uh, Minneapolis's ordinance and uh, the case at the Minnesota Supreme Court and the court addressing the issue of preemption and that state law didn't preempt uh, the ordinance. And so we include a provision on preemption. Uh, then we get into our definitions. And as Mr. Sable alluded to, one of the outstanding issues uh, for the city council to provide direction on is for the concept of seasonal employees. Uh, this this concept and the definition would be found here in the definitions of employees uh, if we include them or if we exclude them from from protection of this ordinance uh, like mr sable said uh, we didn't get consensus on this issue uh, at the task force um, but the task force did take a vote and a majority are in favor of including seasonal employees um, the the discussion started around uh, comparing the three cities in Minnesota that have existing uh, earned safe and sick leave, which is Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth. Uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul uh, don't have the specific exclusion for seasonal employees. They are, I think, would be considered uh, an employee uh, that would accrue leave under their programs. But for some reason, the city of Duluth decided to specifically exclude seasonal employees. Next, uh, we would have our, you know, how employees accrue time. Uh, pretty consistent through throughout the cities in Minnesota and, and really nationally, uh, employees can earn one hour of sick and safe leave for every 30 hours worked uh, up to a maximum of 48 hours. And I believe that when we met on January 3rd, Councilmember Lohman, you had uh, discussed maybe potentially changing some of those numbers. Uh, so if the council still wants to consider that, staff would look for direction from council on that as well. Um, 
then we include, you know, when an employee gets to use their accrued safe and sick leave. Um, you know, we have sections on for the employee's mental and physical illness, injury, health condition, uh, medical diagnosis. And then we also then extend that to family members. And we talked about at the task force, trying to create a really inclusive definition of family members, um, you know, that would include, you know, parents, siblings, um, you know, and, and then it would extend to anyone living within the same household as well. So, um, so the task force was really, I think, mindful of creating an inclusive definition of family. Uh, and employees get to use it for uh, absences due to domestic abuse, sexual assault, and stalking, uh, any, anything that they need to take care of, you know, medically in those situations, but also to seek counseling and to seek legal advice or to participate in legal proceedings uh, related to those incidences. Then we get into the um, the exercise of rights. Employees have the ability to um, to receive protection from retaliation uh, for seeking, uh, you know, the city's assistance or for complaining about a potential violation to the city. Then we get into more of kind of the notifying employees at the job sites, uh, requiring the employers to post a notice of of the ordinance in a location that is accessible to employees, uh, what records employers are supposed to keep and for how long they're supposed to keep them, and then granting the city attorney's office access to those records in order to conduct an investigation. Uh, we have a section on termination, transfer, and separation. So what happens when the employee separates from employment or transfers to another division uh, that doesn't include work inside the city of Bloomington? Um, Within this section, I want to highlight that there is a provision that um, if an employee separates employment and they return to the same employer within 90 days, um, then the accrued sick leave is then returned to uh, the employee. I think this is important regarding our discussion on seasonal employees. And so if council wants to consider, um, you know, extending seasonal employees you know, the protections of the ordinance, you know, typically a seasonal employee won't return uh, within 90 days. It's typically a longer period, you know, six months. Uh, for example, I think of, you know, summer staff, they work for the summer, they leave and they go to school uh, for nine months and then they return. Uh, so this would be one area that we would want to maybe possibly look at. You're getting your direction on if you want to include seasonal employees and then as well as, um, then we get into the enforcement, how the city attorney's office would do an investigation, uh, potentially enter into settlement negotiations uh, with the employer and an employee. And then the final section would be on the relief and administrative penalties. Uh, last time we met on January 3rd, council gave direction to staff that we'd like to, you would like to see a tiered approach to enforcement. Uh, similar to what St. Paul does within their ordinance as far as, you know, escalating the civil penalties for subsequent violations of the ordinance. Uh, and then civil enforcement, um, you know, authorizing the city attorney's office to take any legal remedies uh, for violations, but then also creating a private right of action. So allowing the employee then to sue for enforcement of the ordinance as well. Um, and then you know, a, a final clause that says that encouraging employee employers then to um, nothing would prohibit them from granting leave or benefits uh, in excess of what the ordinance would require. So that is a, a really quick summary of, of the structure and, and layout of the ordinance uh, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Zuniga. So as I looked through here, uh, the things, uh, and in the packet highlighted in yellow, are those the discussion items you need clarified by the end of our meeting tonight to, to continue moving this forward? Mr. Mayor, that is correct. Um, those are, are items that we would like direction from you uh, or from the council on. 
um, or those are items that, depending on your direction, that I think that we would need to address and change so that uh, the ordinance would be consistent with your direction. Got it. Thank you. Council questions. Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just to make sure my what I'm kind of picturing my brain is correct here. So, uh, a seasonal employee, say somebody uh, mowing lawns, that's a position. It's only existing for that short time where the work is is relevant potentially. Versus, say, I used to work at a restaurant over at Mall of America for three months during the summer. To the example you brought up, and then head away. But that position still exists year round. I guess how how are we defining seasonal employee? Is it the length of the existence of the position itself? Mr. Mayor and Council Member Martin, uh, right now there is a definition uh, for seasonal employees. Uh, let me bring it up really quick. Uh, it would be an employee who's appointed for no more than six months during any 12 consecutive months, but who is expected to return uh, to work year after year. Uh, and I think if if council wants to uh, provides a direction that seasonal employees would be protected by this ordinance, uh, my recommendation would be to actually just remove the reference to seasonal employees uh, altogether, and they would be included in the definition of employee, which would be any full-time, part-time, or, or temporary staff, um, and then recommend that change within uh, section 12.152, section D, which is you know extending right now what is 90 days to potentially longer to account for you know the the short duration then you leave for a certain period of time and then you are you do return. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry I missed who had their hand up for his council member Loman or council member Coulter. Let's go with council member Col council member Coulter. Council member Coulter. I'm sorry, now I missed who you called on. Council Member Coulter. <laughs> okay. Um, I To that point, Peter, the, the question I have is hopefully easily answered, but is there a concern that if seasonal seasonal employees are simply, le simply left out of the definition that an employer could sort of <clears throat> um, could use that to sort of say, since they're not mentioned specifically, they aren't covered by the ordinance. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Coulter, I think an employer can certainly raise a number of arguments, um, but I would think that you know we would take the position that um, since if, if we do change the the separation clause, if they do return within that certain period of time, they would be covered under that clause. Okay, thank you. Um, that was. My only question. I have some thoughts on on specific items, but I will let other folks ask questions first. Councilmember Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. So I just have two questions. Uh, now I've got a series of other items too, like Councilmember Coulter had mentioned. So um, on call, how does that work with this? Um, does that fit into seasonal? Is that an extension of? Uh, you know, some other type of uh, work form. How does that work with this uh, this ordinance? Mr. Mayor, Council Member Lohman, uh, there still is the requirement that they do have to perform uh, 80 hours of work within the city limits in order to qualify. So if they are on call, they would still have to, to meet that 80 hour requirement of working within the city. So once they pass that, pass that threshold, of of the 80 hours actually worked so the on-call portion of it does not count in terms of hours worked that's the way i'm understanding what you're saying that is correct council member Mullen. but once i got to that 80 hours then then that too could be considered to be uh uh working hours or they would be covered by this particular ordinance yeah that is correct council member Mullen. and then uh with respect to um, I just want to make sure I have an understanding of the, the 90 days. So if, if we have seasonal work, um, my understanding is you, you, you're not covered until you have passed that, that 80 threshold or the 90 days worth of work. Um, uh, so 
I'm just trying to understand this in respect to seasonal workers or other forms of, of work workers. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Lohman, uh, the way it would work is if let's for for example, you started uh, the beginning of May, uh, you would have to work 80 hours uh, to start accruing time under the ordinance. You work for the entire summer and at the end of August, you say left and went back to, to college. Um, if you return to the employer within 90 days, any time that you accrued uh, during your during the summer, that would be returned to you and you could still use it under the ordinance. But you wouldn't be able to you wouldn't be able to call in sick during that 90 the 90 days, as it were, if you were scheduled for those 90 days throughout that that period of time. So if, let's say you start in June. And you're done by the end of August, which is, I mean, it's probably, it's a little bit more than that, you know, 92 days. <laughs> well, I guess you know, if you, you don't include weekends, it wouldn't be 90, 90 days. Right. So you wouldn't be able to, to, to call in sick during that period of time at all until you maybe came back the next year or, or if, if we set it up with that. So that, was that my understanding correct? I, I think I understand you, Councilman Romo, and I think I would agree with you. Um, sure. You know, and certainly that would not prohibit the employer from allowing the employee to use it you know before those 90 day waiting period but as our but as our ordinance would be constructed as it is today you got 90 days and then you you're eligible for utilizing that time that is correct okay thank you council member carter thank you mayor uh, so you talked a little bit about the preemption piece, and so I understand that if a national or a federal or a state policy were to be passed, ours would be preempted. Um, but I'm curious of how that impacts the enforcement piece. So if we pass this and, um, you know, we dedicate resources toward enforcement, but then the state passes it next legislative session, um, would we still then, I mean, our policy would be preempted but then would we still be accountable for um, the enforcement piece or would the state then, uh, like the Department of Labor, be uh, dead, like in charge of the enforcement piece and dedicating resources to that? Mr. Mayor, Council Member Carter, um, I'm hesitant to speak on legislation that I haven't seen yet. Um, but, but most likely if legislation is passed at the state level, it would be a state level agency that would enforce it. Okay, great. Um, and then my second question, as of now, you know, where we're at, would you say that we are in pretty close alignment with what other cities have passed? And I asked because in my conversations with um, some businesses, uh, people in the business community, you know, they're, they would like us to see something, like see us pass something that is very similar to um, Minneapolis or St. Paul. And so I'm just kind of curious. I remember when we first started having these conversations that you had laid out, um, like what the different cities, what the, what their, the components of their policies look like. And I'm curious, and it doesn't have to be now, but maybe in the next conversation, we could see that comparison to where we've landed and how that compares to other, uh, cities. Cause I know from a business perspective, uh, who, you know, who cross city boundaries, especially, in kind of the core cities here of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Bloomington, this can be an operational challenge. And so I'd be curious to know how we are comparing. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Carter, um, and Mr. Sable, please jump in. Um, but I, during the task force conversations, that was also a, a pretty um, common goal for the task force was to have that consistency, especially with Minneapolis and St. Paul given the geographic location and in proximity to us. Um, and I would say for the most part, our ordinance is pretty consistent with Minneapolis. And then um, the, you know, there are some provisions where St. Paul and Minneapolis differed. And there are some provisions that we actually did pull from St. Paul as well. But from uh, from those two cities, we are pretty consistent. Okay, thank you. And then on the seasonal workers, I'm, I would be comfortable keeping them as a covered uh, as covered in the policy. Councilmember Nelson and Councilmember Coulter. Councilmember Nelson. Thanks, Mayor. And I think we talked about this a little bit last time, but can you refresh me how virtual work impacts this policy? 
uh, people that live in Bloomington, but maybe work um, in a different community and occasionally work from home. Um, how does that work in terms of the accrual of hours? And then how does that work from the definition of uh, scheduled hours if they were sick? Mr. Mayor, Council Member Nelson, um, I would like to tell you that we have that completely figured out right now. Um, you know, and when we talked on January 3rd, you know, I had committed to doing some additional research on that. Um, and I'm still continuing to do the research. I haven't found, you know, any other, um, you know, government entity that's addressed that um, or that's created, you know, a definition for remote work. Um, you know, I was optimistic because Colorado actually passed a version of this uh, in, I believe, July of 2020. So still during the pandemic. Uh, and they were actually silent on the issue. And so this topic actually did come up at the Advisory Board of Health as well. And so I'm still trying to do the research and, and reach out to colleagues to get ideas on how do we address this, this new environment that we're working in. But in the final ordinance for your consideration, remote work will be addressed. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate the follow up on it. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, sorry to sort of double dip like this, but I uh, remembered another question that I wanted to ask, and and I just wanted to clarify um, this language on preemption. Um, am I correct in understanding that if you know, and I try to, you know, it's all of course purely hypothetical, but if, for example, the state were to adopt an earn sick and safe leave policy that were a, a less generous benefit, say one hour for every, I think we have 30, so if it's say one hour for every 40 hours worked, for example, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> would this, I mean, would that preempt this ordinance? Would would employers not be, would, would employers only be required to provide that one hour for every 40 hours worked or would it still be for 30? Mr. Mayor, Council Member Coulter, um, again, I'm hesitant to comment on legislation that we haven't seen. Um, there's, I think, a lot of issues that we would have to look at and consider when analyzing preemption, you know, based off of kind of the different theories of preemption. You know, so we have express preemption where the states comes out and says, you know, local units of government are preempted. Um, you know, we would also have to look at um, area preemption where the state has taken a stance where they are regulating this entire area of law um, or conflict preemption. Um, and then we would have to look at the language of, of our ordinance and the legislation that they would pass to determine if there's a conflict. Um, so the short answer is uh, it, we would have to look at any legislation before we can make a determination. Sure, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, and then I, as I said, I do have thoughts. I don't know if any anyone else has any Questions. Well, what I think I'd like to do, uh, Councilmember Coulter, and I'll get to you in just a second, Councilmember Loman, because I think you might be in the same boat. Uh, the the different issues that we need to talk about. I'm assuming your thoughts are about the different issues we need to talk about. Correct. And maybe if we go through one by one, and we can have the discussion on things like um, seasonal employees and size of business, that kind of thing, and just kind of work our way through. Unless you have additional thoughts beyond what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, Councilmember Maloman, I'll get good. to you in just one second. I know that Mr. Sable had a comment. He wanted to chime in as well. Mr. Sable? Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Council Member Carter, you had asked a question about kind of the comparisons and, and the making sure that the ordinance was consistent with the other cities. And so um, I pulled together the uh, a chart that outlined kind of the comparisons. And um, by and large, this document uh, reflects mostly the uh, Minneapolis ordinance, uh, number one, because it's a nearest neighbor, but it's also been tested in the legal community. I think there's two areas where we've had some variation. And um, one, the, the task force recommended the Duluth model for a timeline for investigations. It actually provides uh, the attorney's office additional time to investigate complaints. Uh, a second area where there was uh, a differentiation from the Minneapolis ordinance was adopting the St. Paul language for graduated fine fee structure. So uh, each successive uh, violation became more and more expensive. So that was an adoption that was um, uh, important there. And I think the third distinction then really relates to this civil enforcement and the, the 
re- task force recommended the Duluth language for a private right of action that uh, an individual would still have standing to sue in court. And I think those are the three main um, deviations from the Minneapolis ordinance. Uh, additional time to investigate, uh, the ability to have a private right of action, and then... Um, Sorry, I just lost it. And then a graduated fee structure. So um, by and large, I would say overwhelmingly sort of mirrors the Minneapolis ordinance to make it consistent, uh, which is three small uh, deviations from that. Councilmember Lohman. And maybe we're going to cover this, but I couldn't, I didn't see it in there. But uh, during the last time we, we uh, met, uh, I had a question uh, with regard to um if an employee, and I, I couldn't find it uh, again the second time around, but uh, um, if an employee um, at a certain point in time, they have to give uh, a doctor's note in order to um, uh, use this time. And I just wanted to be sure I, I was clear about understanding that that, that requirement, um, that, that, uh, that the employer could require that. Mr. Zunica? Mr. Mayor, Council Member Lohman. Uh, that provision is in there. Um, let me. Uh, so it's located in what's now 12.147 uh, paragraph D, uh, which says that it's not a violation of, of the ordinance for an employer to require reasonable documentation that's sick and safe time covered uh, for absences uh, of more than three consecutive days. Um, I don't think that this ordinance requires the employer to require the employee to submit documentation, but rather provides direction to the employer that it's not a violation if they wanted to to require that documentation. And so, and that that what I'm trying to square that with is, um, you know, we talk about the purpose of this of this uh, of this particular piece is to ensure workers employed in the city of Bloomington to address their health needs and their and their families uh, are requiring employees to provide a minimum level of sick and safe leave, um, including time uh, for family care. And, and my issue with that is that that seems to create a barrier uh, for entry if the employer does not provide medical insurance. Um, I just don't know how you would come up with that documentation uh, if you don't have that uh, if, if the if the uh, if the employer doesn't provide that, so that seems to contradict uh, one of the uh, premises or the purposes of our uh, uh, of our um, of our of this potential ordinance. So that that's what I'm trying to square in my mind. Uh, that if you require that, how would an employee do that if they don't have access to medical insurance? Mr. Mayor, Council Member Lohman. Um, you know, certainly if the council wants to provide direction to, to staff and, and requiring that, you know, that is something that we're looking for. And I think that is actually one of the um, one of the issues that we are looking for direction on. Yeah, good point, Council Member Lohman. Good, good point. So if we could just kind of give uh, some staff direction here, uh, rather than kind of scattershot, um, as I as I asked Mr. Zuniga, the the stuff in yellow, the items in yellow is what we want to be talking about. And if you go to page 399 in the council packet, is where the first appears, and it's under the definitions. And we start looking at the definition of employees, and looking for thoughts on including seasonal employees. And I see also remote workers are are highlighted there. Uh, Mr. Zuniga, I think you mentioned it, but just remind me again. Minneapolis and St. Paul do not mention or call out seasonal employees. Is that correct? But Duluth does specifically? That is correct, Mr. Mayor. All right. So, uh, again, trying to just kind of work our way through this. Thoughts on this specific item? Anyone have thoughts or ideas? Councilmember Carter? Thank you, Mayor. Um, my position of... Um, including them would be to be in alignment with Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, so that would be my preference. And you say, so to make it consistent with Minneapolis and St. Yes. Paul, which means then seasonal employee would not be list would not be mentioned in the definition of employees. Right. So then. Gotcha. Okay. Included if they're working. Either. Yes. Yeah. Yep. yep. As opposed to called out specifically. So, okay. 
Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I do agree. Seasonal employees um, should be included. Should be covered by the ordinance, which is to say that they should not be expressly mentioned in the ordinance. Um, I hope you all follow that construction. Um, I would add, and I know, of course, that we are going to come to it. That I don't think there is much purpose in covering seasonal employees if they're not able to use the sick and safe leave if they only return to that employer within 90 days. And we, I know we will come to that. So I'm, I'm just prefacing that and, and stating that if we're going to cover seasonal employees, I think we're going to need to change that section. Councilmember Lohman. Yeah, I would, unless we're going to address the, the less than 90 days, I would not want to cover them or even, even mention them in here. Uh, so I'll wait till we get to that point and then I'll decide how I want to uh, I'll move forward with that. Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, similarly, I, I would support just uh, removing it so they are covered, I guess, Again, making sure it's lined up. Uh, and I, I come at it in part from just the, the public health angle, considering the surge in hiring for seasonal employees we see in our leisure and hospitality industry, kind of lining up with peaks in tourism. Uh, so from a public health angle, I think it makes sense to get them in there. Councilmember D'Alessandro? <laughs> I have no additional comment. All right. uh, my only my only thought on that, I, I understand, I, and I would agree to take the, the definition of seasonal employees out, but um, from a practical standpoint, just thinking about how long they have to work a seasonal employee, uh, I mean, uh, Mr. Zuniga mentioned starting in May, I mean, realistically, they would start in June after school lets out or about that time. By the time they've worked their 80 hours to become eligible for sick leave, sick and safe leave, um, we're, talk we're talking over the course of the rest of the summer, probably a eight or 12 hours tops that they would accrue over the, the course of time. So um, I, I can understand some employers looking at this and, and worrying that, oh my goodness, seasonal employees, and but realistically, uh, for both the employer and frankly for the employee, this this isn't a huge issue because I think it will, it will be less than two days uh, based on just the hours that they're gonna work and the hours that they're gonna accrue over the course of the summer, just realistically. Any additional thoughts on that? Do we have consensus that we, uh, in this backward logic, do we include seasonal employees by not mentioning seasonal employees? Do we have consensus on this? I've got, uh, I see a few thumbs, nodding heads. Everybody okay with that? All right. Is that clear, Mr. Zunigan, Mr. Uh, Sable? Mr. Mayor and council members, yes. Thank Very you. Very good. As I mentioned also on page 399, remote workers are highlighted in yellow. And I don't know that we've fully addressed that or if it's even addressable. Is that what you is that what the point you were making earlier, Mr. Zuniga? Yes, Mr. Merritt. Uh, doing the research on how do we address it, kind of given you know our new environment and no other government unit has addressed it within their their ordinances. Um, you know, so like Councilmember Nelson mentioned. You know, an employee that's working 100% at home, you know, for an employer that might be located in Wisconsin, um, you know, how do we how do we strike that balance and write that language so that we create some clarity for for everyone? Understood. So we're we're comfortable not not addressing that because there's no precedent set, and we're not sure exactly the direction that we are able to go in that. Uh, if you move on to uh, the bottom of page 400, we have another yellow highlight, and that's the determination of business size. And I think we, that's kind of the calling it out. And then if you go down to the top of page 403 is where the actual draft language is uh, regarding employer size, uh, how many employees they do have. And I know we had this conversation last time. Uh, the way it's written now, it talks about an employer with six or more employees must compensate the employee at a regular rate. An employee with five or fewer employees uh, Offer, must offer unpaid use of accrued sick and safe time. So uh, comments or questions or direction on that for staff as we try and resolve that and move this forward. Council Member, uh, Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Well, um, I, I think I made my position on this uh, clear last time we talked that um, I, I do think uh, employees at businesses of all size should be able to earn 
uh, paid sick and safe leave. Um, I, you know, I, I think it just makes sense. I think it's, it's also, um, my suspicion would be that is that it would be easier for employers to, to track so that they're not on this sort of dual track paid unpaid, um, question there. Um, I, I think it just makes sense. And, and that, that would just be my preference as far as the direction we go. Thank you. Council member, council member D'Alessandro. Um, Given that um, many small businesses are, um, for lack of a better way to put it, subsistence businesses, I actually think it's bur overly burdensome to uh, to go uh, and and require paid sick on top of them. I mean, I I spent some time in uh, some of the employers in the Penn Plaza area at 90th and Penn, for example. And uh, every single one of them I spoke to um, is either is five or under employees who mostly are family members who mostly just handle the problem when there's a you know an issue like that. There's also another consideration, and that is that uh, uh, companies that are just starting out, we want to enable them to grow into the kind of business that requires a lot of the burdens that we place on them, right? Um, kicking, kicking the, adding, adding this kind of thing to a um, to a small business and 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 burdening them with legal requirements and things like that when when they're just trying to get up and running, um, I think ca causes problems. I mean, as an anecdote, um, I was in a company of. 200 and because of the Sarbanes Oxley rules that came out that burdened businesses of a, below a certain size un, unduly, uh, we went we were on penny stocks for too, before too long, right? So these things have a these things have a natural way of curbing um, growth, and I would not want us to put something like that in place. Um, so I, I would prefer us to. Um, Frankly, I'd I'd like to say ten or more, <laughs> but but I will compromise tonight. But I, I think uh, there's a there's a floor there, um, and I think um, it, if this is it, then I would be for that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I would um, you know I totally understand where Councilmember Coulter is coming from on this, but I tend to agree with Councilmember Delisandro in terms of the burden on those really small companies. Um, I also would probably prefer a ten or more, just given the number of small businesses I know and what I've seen and where they're at. But um, uh, I, I just. I think that we we want to encourage our companies to grow, to grow in Bloomington, and to get to that point. And I think those smaller companies do have uh, ways of addressing these things with, uh, with uh, in their organizations. And like Councilmember Delisandro said, a lot of those employees are probably um, family members, um, things like that. That when they're getting started, trying to do that, working, you know too many hours anyways um, at that point in their development cycle. So um, I think it's something to take a look at um, in the future and see, um, you know, if we're missing a large group of people um, or having issues with that. But I think where we're most concerned are probably a lot of the retail restaurant, things like that, where people are inside congregated together um, the public is there, and that's where we're seeing a lot of the issues, particularly pandemic-related, of of illnesses and things of that nature. Um, so that that's kind of where I would be. Um, the other distinction I'd look at is where the the job is, indoor, outdoor, close proximity, that type of stuff. So, um, like I said, I think it gets a little bit into that uh, remote worker part as well. Um, I mean, how does sick time apply if you're at home and sick <laughs> you know i mean i certainly don't want i certainly don't want someone serving me food while they're sick um but you know are they so sick that they can't work at their computer at home i don't know you know uh th those are some of the tough questions that i think this whole last couple of years have raised on this issue but um so appreciate it, uh, the question on this thank you council member council member Loman. So, um, I guess for, for myself, when I, when I, I think about this particular idea, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, you know, can the business afford, uh, to be able to, uh, support this, uh, this particular item. And, and so I think it's interesting when we talk about six or 10, you know, 20, 
Um, and I wonder if there's a way to um, get at this differently rather than the size of, of your staff, but rather um, uh, in terms of you know profitability or some other measure that could be used uh, to determine uh, where the, this this paid time comes in. I, I typically I, I tend to, to kind of favor what uh, uh, Councilmember Coulter is talking about. We want to make sure as many businesses within the city uh, uh, provide um, uh, this sick time um, as, as possible. And I, I am very concerned about small businesses uh, that, that don't have the economic means uh, to be able to achieve that. And typically we do find it with, you know, the smaller employee sizes, but I do wonder if there are um, employers that would be, um, you know, below the six or below the 10 uh, that would uh, continuously not need to have additional staff and either automate that staff to keep it underneath that, but still bring in uh, additional revenues. And so I, I guess uh, I would just like to see if there's some other way to, to, to go about uh, uh, about addressing the, the uh, smaller businesses uh, that, uh, that may need that, that, that period of time or a window uh, to get there. I, I understand where you're going with this, uh, Councilmember Lohman, but I'm, for the life of me, not able to come up with what metric you might use to, to make that measurement. Um, I, I don't know. If, if you have suggestion, I'd it, it, it's an interesting thought, I agree, but I, it's just a, it's a tricky one. I mean, do you go, I mean, yearly income, which obviously we know can be, right, can be manipulated, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. But, no, no, and I, I get that part of it, and I, and I, I'm not su suggesting a solution, but I, I'm just, uh, I'm, asked, I'm raising the question. Uh, you know, maybe there is some innovative out there. It's well beyond my, <laughs> my creative ability. Uh, maybe staff knows something uh, or something out there, but uh, I, I think that I just want to address the problem, sure. but. Uh, because I do certainly have a problem with with six. I, I'd rather see ten, but I don't want to see somebody take advantage of ten. You know, yeah. uh, being able to. You, you, I think you understand what I mean. I, I do, uh, Mr. Sable. Your hand went up. Uh, 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 thank you, Mayor thank Council, you, Mayor Council members. Um, sorry, wrong mute button. I apologize for that. Um, the task force did spend a considerable amount of time wrestling with this very question about what is the appropriate size and how would we determine it. And I think one of the uh, considerations that uh, the, the staff and the task force talked about was the ability to how would we collect that data? How would we store that information? How would we use it in our decision making process? And it became I think uh, more burdensome to gather sensitive financial data on these companies. And so the task force really, I think, wrestled with um, the right size and the right metric. And I think the, the Minneapolis model, um, because they went first, um, sort of set the standard for business size. And uh, one of the task force members that we had on our task force uh, was actually a part of the original Minneapolis uh, discussion and was able to provide a lot of context for why six versus 10 versus 20. And so um, it really provided the task force some really good information. And there was um, a general consensus that if you're going to have a size threshold, it should be number of employees. And that was the sort of the magic number as the compromise solution that was identified in Minneapolis and the group um, considered that as part of our uh, ordinance as well. Well, in that case, Mayor, I guess I'm going to go with the Jenner principle, uh, uh, reconforming uh, uh, to other cities. So, Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Do we have any um, data or information from the city of Minneapolis? And I'm not sure what St. Paul and Duluth's uh, ordinance say uh, regarding this, but regarding impacts to small businesses, I mean, my understanding is they have not actually seen a huge negative impact from a financial perspective, but that's just kind of more anecdotal. Uh, and I think that most of, I don't, I, I want the decision to be made less on anecdotes and more on like, what did, what has Minneapolis seen? Have they seen businesses struggle with implementing this of a certain size? Um, Council Member Carter, I, I'm with you completely. In fact, I asked for that the last time we brought this up, and I I was disappointed to see that it no no criticism, just it it wasn't in the packet this time around. And so I, I was going to bring up at the end of this that I'm still looking for that data, because if you are modeling something after something else, there's an implication there that you have some information that says it's a good thing. <laughs> and and I frankly don't think that we do one way or the other based on the little bit that I've seen. And so I would be 100% interested in understanding what four years later, five years later, how are they doing? 
it would be a really great thing for us to know. Thanks. Mr. Sable, uh, I, I know there was, as Councilmember Carter referenced, there was a, a study or there was something that came out about the impact of this on business in Minneapolis. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, uh, I am f trying to, as we're talking, trying to find that report that we used. I know that Kate Ebert was able to pull some information uh, specifically on how it's been used more from the perspective of uh, usage from the employees that were affected than less on the in, on the mm -hmm. business owner side. And so if you just give me a little bit of time, I'll uh, quickly search that file. Well, and, and I appreciate uh, quickly searching the file, but I think to Councilmember D'Alessandro's point and Councilmember Carter's point, uh, it, it, I'd rather not rush through this. I'd rather make sure that we do this correctly if we're going to do this. And if there is information available, if there has been a study done, even if it's from the employee's side, to have that information and be able to consider that as we work through this, I think would be helpful. Uh, I think and the, the only time constraints I think we're putting on this are our own. And so we have the time to, to make sure that we get the information that we need to make the, the, the correct decision for, for the city of Bloomington. Councilmember Nelson, you had your hand up earlier, and then I saw it go down. Did you have a, a comment? Um, no, Mayor. I was just trying, um, just looking at something to see if it uh, how is conformed to like um, FMLA or anything like that in terms of employee uh, number of employees. Because I use the, I know they use that metric. And then to Councilmember Lowman's point, I, I don't think we should be asking uh, businesses to submit their financial statements to the city. Oh. Well, Take a strong stand there. <laughs> so, I would tend to agree with you, Councilmember Nelson. Thanks. Uh, perhaps this is one we should defer this this uh, question about size of business, and um, until we get a little bit more information or as much information as are, is available, and it's it's possible that there isn't, you know, four or five years in, maybe they haven't measured it, I or measured it to a point that there is reliable and accurate data as to how it's how it's all working I'm, I don't know and so it, it the more we could learn on that I think would be would be helpful so if we could maybe uh, table that part of it and uh, as I work my way through here I think the 90 days is the next question on page 405 the separation if uh, someone is re rehired within 90 days that the uh, the previously accrued sick and safe time um, should be reinstated um, I, I don't know, was our question on this whether or not it should even happen or the length of time? I can't recall what we discussed on this. Mr. Sable, any thoughts or Mr. Zuniga? Where, where were we on this from the previous discussion? Well, Mr. Mayor, council members, I think this, um, this is highlighted for, it fits within the discussion of seasonal employees um, and whether if a seasonal employee returns as the same employer, uh, do they still have access to the unused accrued time that they accrued for the summer before? Uh, and if council wants wants them to have access to that, we would need to extend or change this this 90 day period. Understood. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I do, and you know, as I sort of said earlier, I do think um, seasonal employees who return should have access to uh, the sick and safe leave time that they they earned previously. I think, I mean, if you if you earn a benefit, you know, you you, you know, I my in sort of principle in in my mind is that you are in, you are entitled to use that benefit in some way, whether that's you know cashing out of 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 paid vacation time when you leave a job or something like that. And so, um, I would say, you know, for me. Um, Given that the definition is already in the ordinance, I think a calendar year would make a lot of sense um, for that number. Um, my my concern is just thinking about. I mean, if it if it's ninety days or if it's six months or or nine months or whatever it is, if I'm you know a, a college kid who works as a lifeguard and I leave beginning of August and don't come back until you know end of you know until June. The following year, that's more than nine months, right? And so, um, I just I want to make sure that that we're putting provisions into this ordinance that are actually doing what we intend them to do. So that's that's why I think the calendar year makes a lot of sense. Other thoughts on this? 
You know, I, I appreciate your comment, uh, Councilmember Coulter, the, the notion of a, of a lifeguard. But I, I mean, also uh, to consider the notion of a seasonal employee. I mean, I'm for for many years I grew up with my dad as a seasonal employee as an electrician because busy during the summer and then over the winter there was nothing and so there was a, th a two or three or four month layoff and so uh, to consider that that notion of, of a seasonal employee is more than just somebody at, you know working at at somewhere at the Mall of America or, or a lifeguard position it could be you know a, a more significant construction position or a land care position or something along those lines as well. Councilmember Nelson and then Councilmember Lowman. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thanks, Mayor, and I appreciate you bringing up that example because I was going to bring it. I know it happens a lot in the trades, road construction, things like that. Um, really, really good jobs, high-paying jobs that um, they just get laid off in the winter and come back the next year, and that's expected. It's part of the business model. Um, the uh, other part, I just want to clarify what council member had said. He said calendar year, and I guess my concern, if the idea is to have seasonal employees, it, that that would end at December. And then you'd have to reaccrue the next year. So was, did I misunderstand what, what you said, uh, Nathan? Or uh, would it be like a an entire year, 12-month period, as opposed to calendar year? Yeah, so I, I based that off the definition of calendar year that's in the ordinance. Uh, um, it says a regular and consecutive 12-month period as determined by an employer and may be based on an employee's employment anniversary date. Okay. So then maybe I'd, for Mr. Zuniga, I need clarification of that because when I hear calendar year, I hear calendar. Um, and so I would assume that it would uh, end at the end of December. Like I'd set a calendar year for my company, January 1 through December 31st. And whatever, whenever you worked in that season would be whatever. But so, and I don't think that was your intent, Council Member Coulter, that it would end at the end of December if that was my fiscal no. calendar, or if that was my calendar year, so. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Coulter, Council Member Nelson, um, I think I understand what both of you are saying, and I will uh, tighten up the language, both within the definition and within this section, uh, if the council decides that this is the path they want to you want to go down, to ensure that I'm capturing uh, your comments accurately. Council Member Lohman. Yeah, I, I was just going to speak on that same piece. I, I I thought maybe you'd change the 90 to 365, but I think uh, Councilmember Nelson Coulter have, have talked about it. I would be concerned about the calendar day or a calendar year meaning something different to different folks, but I, it's all been said. So can I ask, are, are we in agreement about uh, the notion of, of a rehire retaining the recruit sick and safe? Are we, are we in agreement with that? Is that a, a yes or a no or a maybe with everyone? Uh, Councilmember Nelson? Yeah, I would be in favor of that with the caveat of, I think there's provisions in terms of how much they can carry over and things like that. Yeah, so that's reasonable. when continually like re year after year and accrue significant amount, but I think that's addressed if, correct me if I'm wrong, but is addressed elsewhere. So I, I think that makes sense. Okay, no, that's a good point. And I do think it's addressed elsewhere, but to maybe again, clean that up and firm that up to, to ensure that it isn't necessarily it doesn't grow burdensome for the uh, for the employer ultimately, but if we can agree on uh, the fact that 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 we should do the carryover, then the question is, what length of time? If it's 90 days or 365 days, or the calendar year from uh, higher date, or something like that, or the 12 month period from higher date to anniversary date, something along those lines. If uh, general agreement there, what what are we thinking there? How how are folks leaning? From folks we haven't heard from, <laughs> Councilmember Coulter, <laughs> and then Councilmember Martin. Councilmember Coulter, thank you, Mayor. I I will try not to dominate the conversation too much too much here. Um, I I you know I picked that calendar year definition just again because it was in the ordinance. I don't I don't feel particularly strongly about how it's con constructed, whether it's 365 days or 12 months or you know 26 fortnights or whatever it is. Um, I, I actually did the math right there. I'm kind of impressed. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think my my point is, and, and I, I think, you know, to the point that you and, and Council Member Nelson raised about um, folks in the trades, that's absolutely a good point. Um, but I, I want to make sure that that 
we are sort of covering as many folks as possible that that um, you know folks obviously folks will you know there will be folks who who take a few months off for whatever reason um, but I do think you know those folks who come back year after year you know the lifeguards the folks who work at the mall and so on um, I think they should be able to to use their accrued time as well so um, that's that's my feeling on on that particular topic. Councilmember Martin. Uh, yeah, I guess just just to be on the record with consensus, I am along the same lines as Councilmember Coulter on this one. So it sounds as though we've got. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Delisandro. I look at the screen. I look at the screen. Yeah, no, no, I mean, okay. you're four people okay. away from me, and of no, course, I'm trying to watch you on the screen. No, no, so. it's totally fine. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I, I want to be. I want to be. I guess I want to center the people that I think most people are concerned about. And, you know, there are seasonal, seasonal employees. Um, uh, lifeguard, I guess, is a good example. I was never able to be a lifeguard. I was busy working, you know, minimum wage retail during holidays. So, um, you know, I want to throw out to you that, you know, when you talk about that you have to think of the Mall of America, for example, and the inordinate number of people who are working between the beginning of October and the end of December, right? And um, I, I don't know if they need our help with this ordinance or not, because again, I don't have the data to tell me. Um, but to me, that on a proportional scale, those are the people to keep in mind when you're doing something like this. I don't mean to be dis barraging of lifeguards. I love them. They're fantastic I, and everything like that. But the number of them in Bloomington versus, versus the number of the seasonal retail employees, you can't even, you can't even, like, that's not even fair comparison, right? So I just throw that out there. Thanks. Other perspectives, other thoughts? So from a consensus standpoint, uh, from a moving forward standpoint, I think we are, I think we have at least four nodding heads that we need to do something here. It's a question of how long. Is, is that a correct assessment? All right, I think that's the correct, that we do have the four nodding heads to do it along this line. Uh, and then it's just a matter of, of the period of time. And um, I think Mr. Zuniga, if you could, perhaps craft this in, uh, clean up the language that that we had talked about, the, the calendar year, the 365 days from the hiring anniversary, somewhere along those lines, and maybe make some clarifications about, or, or strengthen the clarifications about maximum crude time. Uh, I think it would be helpful and it might address what we're working toward here. Is everybody in agreement with that? All right. And unless I'm wrong, as I look through the draft here, that's the last yellow highlight that I see. That I see. Is that correct, Mr. Zuniga? That is correct, Mr. Mayor. Councilmember Nelson, question? Yeah, I just have three quick ones, really quick, Mayor, but it's all right. Um, Councilmember Coulter had said something about cashing out. Is it possible to cash out your earned sick and safe time under this ordinance, or would that be an optional feature an employer might put in there? Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Nelson, that is not within the ordinance, and so that would be an optional uh, okay. consideration for the employer. Um, in terms of employee count, does the owner count in the counting of employees and or immediate family members? So I guess my question is, do I have to count myself? And I'm way over the threshold, just so you know. So, And I already provide this to all my employees. So. so. Mr. The, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Nelson, the determination of the employer size is based upon the average number of employees per week during the previous calendar year. Um, right now, we are, I think it is silent on whether it would include uh, the owner of the business uh, or the family members. Okay. My assumption is that then it would include it. That's what I've normally seen, but there are some things like unemployment insurance and other things like that where the owner can essentially opt out of the system because it's, you know, if I'm sick, I'm just going to work twice as much tomorrow. Um, you know, I, I still have to do the work. It doesn't go away. It's so, um, 
So I think that clarifies it. The last thing, just not really a question, but just information I'd like to see before the final ordinance is if we have uh, any estimated cost for the city to do this, to um, implement this program, if we'll have to add staff people. I know we've run into that on other policy decisions we've made in the past, and I just wanna make sure that that information is with this as we're making that final decision whenever that comes up. And if there is any way to take a look at, I think to what Council Member D'Alessandro's point, the cost that this would have for employers, I can tell you this year I've already spent at least uh, $3,000 for sick leave for people in my own company and um and happy to do it it's our policy and we've done it for a long time um would prefer they don't come if they're sick so uh but obviously with omicron ripping through com companies there were uh, unfortunately a lot more illnesses this year than there have been in other years so um so i just trying to get my head around what this would actually cost people if there's any way to estimate that based on what we've seen in other cities that would be great Thanks, Councilmember Nelson. So I, I think as we worked our way through some of these things, I think the the bottom line is that we're still looking for information. We're still trying to get comfortable with the decisions that we're trying to make. And if there is any way to find the information, detailed, specific metrics, information, statistics on all of this, I think it would help folks be able to, to make up their minds one way or another on all of this. So, uh, I mean, to the staff, if uh, if that that is the direction, you've got the information that we're uh, that we discussed here and reached consensus on, but then also a request for additional information on a lot of items as well. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Just to be specific, if I may, Mr. Mayor, a couple of the, the data elements, if, if we think we can get them, that I would be super interested in. Um, one would be, um, you know, if we're making a kind of a hypothesis that the, that the places that are suffering uh, right now to hire employees are, are suffering in part because um, they're the ones that most likely don't have the, this kind of thing in place that's offering as a benefit, right? I'd love to know if that's true, if that assumption that we might be hypothesizing is correct. So our restaurants, uh, not ours, but in general in Minneapolis, is it the restaurants and fast food organizations that are the most, you know, that they getting the violations from or the most concerned? Hotel, grocery, right? Those frontline workers, anything that could help us validate that those are the populations of folks that, um, that would be most at risk um, if Bloomington didn't put something like that together. Um, the other thing I'd love to know is how many of the of the organizations that we believe will be impacted by offering this here in Bloomington also already have places in Minneapolis or St. Paul or Duluth or where where this is in place already. So, you know, our population of of employers versus the ones that may have already had to deal with this comparatively. So who's left, I guess, if you will, um, would be really helpful. And I don't know if we can come up with any of that, but that kind of data would be certainly helpful to really just understand the impact of this. And then I think the last thing would be what population of our businesses has less than five or 10 employees. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Council, anything else to add? Council member Lohman. Um, I don't know if this is available, um, uh, through the employment office, uh, I'd be curious to know within the first 90 days, uh, how many, uh, folks are getting terminated. Um, and I don't know if they can break it down any, you know, in terms of what the rationale from, from a sick standpoint, or, or if there's any, uh, demographic detail on that, I'd be curious to kind of see what, you know, 90 days, 120 days, um, what those terminations look like. That's if that data is even available to the general public either Minneapolis or St. Paul, comparing that to maybe other cities that don't have the uh, uh, the uh, sick time leave policy. Staff will dig into that as well. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I, I think it's become clear over this conversation that we are probably not going to stick to the timeline that um, staff had laid out previously. So I'm wondering, obviously, you know, it takes time and, and there's a lot of unknown yet. Um, if staff could uh, give us a rough idea of, of kind of when they think we might, uh, they might come back with this information and, and what the process might look like from there. And I think in fairness to staff council member, what, uh, let's, let's let them
chew on this for a while and see what they can find out first and, and figure out what we have on future agendas and f find where this all fits in. I mean, I understand the, uh, the desire to get through this and to move this along, but I also want to make sure that if we're going to ask them to find information that we give them the time to actually get out there and find it. Fair enough. Councilmember Vidal Sandro. Sorry, uh, I have a question. I had one other item that wasn't expressly highlighted in uh, Mr. Zuniga's comments that I would love to get some feedback on if there was possibility. Please, what do you have? And, and this may not be the right, tell me if we should table it to the next time we discuss this, but um, uh, one, one of the areas of opportunity, I, I know we have a lot of documentation or a lot of verbiage around uh, the penalty process. Um, and uh, we modeled that, it sounds like, from uh, other areas. It sounds like we took a combination of Minneapolis and Duluth or something to that effect. Great. Um, I'd like to propose, because of the nascency of this kind of thing in our area, that we make the first offense a warning and education component as opposed to immediately to fine and, and penalty and everything else. And I say that just because um, I don't think I don't think the employers – I don't think most employers, I could be wrong, work for a lot of companies. Um, I don't think most employers are actively trying to harm their employees and um, and would willfully violate this once we put it in place, I guess is what I'm saying. So, you know, does it help us to put something like, you know, your first offense is a warning in front of all of that step up that we have there? Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else has thought about this or if that's amenable. Um, shoot it down or raise it up, I'm good with it, but I, I think it um, is something, you know, it took, what, two years of enforcement, or two years of education before Minneapolis was even willing to put it into enforcement, right? So we obviously can learn from that situation that throwing this in here without an opportunity for the businesses around us to uh, um, adapt, you know, might be problematic. So just question. I mean, that's a good, good suggestion, and I would be amenable to that. I think it's a good idea. Uh, I would also suggest a sunset on that. I would say after two years or pick a date, then then the first offense is a, a there, there's a finable offense after the first offense. But up until that time, it is a it's a warning and education. I think that makes good sense. But to not do it in perpetuity because after a couple of years, folks should be up on this. Maybe uh, also, sir, we could um, consider you know new companies who are learning about it versus. Companies who you know who have been after that two year period of time should know better, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. that Thanks. would make sense. Everybody okay with that? Think that's a reasonable accommodation for this type of new requirement? Very good, good suggestion. Anything further? Have you got enough to work on there? Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, yes, uh, okay. and this was an incredibly helpful uh, discussion, and so I appreciate the the time and energy that went into this. And uh, I'll just I'll note that uh, a lot of these uh, questions are wrestled with the task force, and we often couldn't get uh, clarity there. And so this is, I think, every time we have a little bit of more conversation, we get a little bit more clarity, and that helps us uh, put something that can be uh, good and approved for the community. And so we're Happy to do some research. Very good. And just to be clear here, uh, despite the time spent and the discussion that was had, uh, I appreciate what we have so far. This is a, a strong draft, I think, that we have so far. The fact that we're that we're picking nits, I think, says a lot that this is uh, well put together and well written and, and a good uh, good overall direction. And to to work out, you know, obviously the devil in the in the details, to work out the de the details being the important part. I think we're at a good spot here, and I commend staff for the work that's gone into this so far. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Zuniga. Mr. Sable, thank you much. Our final item of the evening, item 8.3, City Council Policy and Issue Update. Mr. Verbrugge. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I have no items for this evening. Council Members, Council Member Martin. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to toss this out there. I know uh, we've all been CC'd on emails from residents, uh, and I've gotten uh, quite a few in District 4 in particular about uh, sidewalk plowing. And I know this has come up in, in previous years, most recently as a level of service conversation for uh, budgeting, kind of as the pandemic first hit. Uh, but I'd be curious to kind of A, learn more about uh, what are the routes that we're prioritizing? Is that around areas of public transportation? Is it just our major roads, Nicollet, Portland, things like that, so I can better understand where we are? Uh, and then I think it'd be helpful as a council to have a conversation about uh, do we want to invest more substantially in making sure that uh, the sidewalks across the community are plowed, especially as we're looking at things like our alternative transportation plan and encouraging this to be a, a walkable, bikeable community. So I just wanted to toss that out there, and I know everybody's seen it recently. So I appreciate that, Councilmember Martin, and I know... Uh, and I don't suppose Carl is still with us, but uh, I, we, we had this discussion just a few years ago trying to look at what we plowed, how we plowed it, how much it cost, and what the savings might be if we didn't clear the streets and, and so on. There's Carl popping back in. But I, I do think, since we did look at this a couple of years ago, I wonder if we could uh, review it and take a, a look back and maybe do a, a bit of lessons learned if, it, if we are doing it correctly, if, we are, uh, if it is the right thing to do. Your level of service question, I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, it's, are, we're, we're doing a good job. Should we be doing a great job? Or is good okay? Or would fair be fine as well? I mean, questions along those lines. And uh, Mr. Keel, I don't know if you've gleaned any additional information after the, the discussion we had a few years back on this, on this very topic, or if there's more that you could provide. And I don't mean to put you on the spot now. Perhaps we could come back and talk about this at a, an upcoming council meeting uh, when we're not in the middle of plowing all these streets and, and these um, these sidewalks that uh, that you're required to do. We've been actually having quite a, a number of conversations about this absolute topic at staff level. And I think that what we could do and maybe commit to is to framing a discussion around this so that we can kind of kind of show what the range of options are and what the range of costs are and uh, see where the council is on, on that, those issues about levels of service and the amount of cost and kind of the challenges and the realities around around the various ones. I mean, for instance, uh, you know, on sidewalk plowing, uh, we could do a better job of sidewalk plowing. It would cost considerably more. Could we ever have a absolute bare pavement policy on sidewalks? I don't think that that's actually even feasible. But so I've, uh, that's kind of just a taste of the sort of discussion we might have. And I think that's exactly the idea here. Uh, exactly the idea. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. It may be part of that. Um, uh, something that would be helpful would be just kind of uh, setting expectations for residents. So, for example, you know, I go running throughout the winter, and I have noticed even close to my house at major intersections that one of the ramps might be plowed onto the like um, pedestrian median or whatever you call it. Um, but then the other side of it is not. So I have to like jump over the snow to cross the crosswalk on France. Um, and so it just raises the question for me, it's like, well, maybe they only, maybe that's the goal is to just get one of the, one of those ramps cleared. But then I'm like, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So some of it is, um, you know, could we do a better job? And some of it is like, maybe there are just some standard practices that are in place to help with efficiencies. I don't know. So just kind of being able to set those expectations with, with residents too, in terms of, you know, what can they expect in the winter? What's realistic? And um, you know where? The, and I know staff has done this in the past, where they've really highlighted where the priority um, sidewalks, like the, the the plowing priorities are, and that's always helpful reminder. But um, any other kind of practices, standard practices that are in place, we can do that. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Keel. Uh, that does that address that, Councilmember Martin? Yeah. Good, Councilmember D'Alessandro. Related to that, um, one of the, um, you know, I had residents ask me, why don't we enforce the, hey, residents, if you're on a public sidewalk, you're responsible for the front, for the sidewalk cleaning. There are people legitimately asking that question because they're wondering why our tax dollars are, are you know, we're doing it above and beyond what the ordinance says. So that's another, that's another lever to consider whether that's, you know, snow up to two inches you're responsible snow over that will come help it out or whatever i don't know what the right answer is but that's another idea that i've seen in, in emails back and forth so thank you other thoughts on this topic 
Not seeing any. Anything else to bring up under 8.3? Eight, 8 Councilmember D'Alessandro. Re related to that topic, actually, and it dovetails nicely, as I was reviewing the um, ADA plan that we approved earlier today, um, and I, I no, this is related to the conversations we're having around snow plowing and sidewalks, but but also the larger notion of sidewalks in general. Is there a reason we don't consider uh, a sidewalk management plan in the same way that we have a pavement management plan? Um, it's a budgetary item, which is why I waited till now to bring it up as opposed to before. But the because it might cost, you know, it, we might have to consider it costing a lot. But the 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 idea being that. If we truly believe that um, that our sidewalks are a form of transit, that we should be investing in maybe carving that out, making it a functional thing like that, which includes maintenance, which is, includes you know expediting ADA compliance, because it, according to what I think I read, you know, not nine years to get all of our our ramps done. That's a long time for the city to wait, right? And I think it's longer for some portions of of the plan as well 2037 i think was the number if we just kept going the way we're going you know i don't i don't know that we should be out of compliance with ada let alone not working on our you know alternative modes of transit for that long so uh, i would like to propose as we think about our budget you know going forward or whatever some notion of a sidewalk management plan that would comprehensively bring some of this together might be a great idea at this point uh, mr verbrugge And I believe, uh, Mr. Harris, I believe I saw Mr. Keel pop back in no. there too. So Carl, if you want to jump in on that, that's fine. Um, I, I would say that we do have a sidewalk management plan similar to pavement management in the sense that it we do keep track of the condition of our sidewalks. Uh, we know how much money we would need to keep them to a certain condition, et cetera. And that was really done in anticipation of our discussions about franchise fees over the past year. And that kind of informed that whole discussion. I'd say where we're not as sophisticated as we should be uh, has to do more with sidewalk planning and trail planning. Uh, we rely heavily on our alternative transportation plan, which was a plan uh, put together some 10 years or better ago. Uh, and I think that that is really in need of kind of an upgrade, if you will, uh, that would try to say what are our, uh, is our vision for non-motorized transportation and how do we accomplish that? Uh, so I think that that's really something that uh, we ought to talk about is how do we develop a, an update to the alternative transportation plan is really the, the step I think we really need to move forward on. Councilmember Lohman. Well, I, I really like this idea um, that uh, the council member Delosanda has brought forward. I know this was a part of that conversation that we had uh, some time ago uh, with regard to uh, that our, our trails kind of have a designated amount of money uh, that, that that gets, you know, we, we were able to pull that out of the franchise fees, but we weren't able to fully fund um, our sidewalks um, because um, it just didn't fit into that particular plan. So, um, uh, for example, when we look at Nicollet Avenue, I know that, that when we look at that, there's some there's other pieces of that because the county has part of the uh, uh, the right of way, and you can't figure that out. But what um, I think what she's putting forward here allows us to address some of these sidewalks that are on the east side uh, of Bloomington, and we really need to kind of look at that. Um, you know, because I, I just I beg to differ that I, I just feel like that that the funding uh, for our sidewalks hasn't really been dedicated. We've got the dedication from our trail standpoint, but not really from our sidewalk uh, point of view. I really think we need to look at how we're going to do that from an ongoing standpoint. Uh, and I would very much support this idea of, you know, having a different process or a dedicated fund by which to kind of look at that, what, like what she's raising here tonight. It's all part of the conversation. If uh, I think we kind of dipped our toe into this with uh, the the discussion around franchise fees, and we've been talking about it as we've as we've seen our major uh, thoroughfares redeveloped and the sidewalks alongside those. So I, especially on the east side uh, of the city. So I think it's it's worth a continued conversation to 
Got to put some meat on these bones. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I, I think that um, what I hear is, you know, the alternative transportation plan has a piece and the franchise fee thing has a piece and the parks and rec folk have a piece and the public works people. And actually, what you know, if we pull that all together and create a comprehensive plan for sidewalk management, um, maybe maybe we see opportunities we're not seeing because of the particular silos of work that are going on. Thank you. Councilmember Carter. Um, to that same point, uh, I recall a couple years ago there were some issues with bus stops and um, getting plowed on time or whatever. So I guess I'm, I say that only because it seems then that if we're having these conversations to bring in Met Council or whoever from Met Transit that would need to be providing some input on their strategies or, I mean, this is the complicating factor, right, of our the transportation system is that some are county roads and some spots are – um, plowed by Met Transit and so, or what you know and so just to have kind of those various perspectives. Any other thoughts on this? All right, very good. Any other contributions to item eight point three? You guys are going to hate me tonight. Sorry, Councilmember Delisson. <laughs> One other thing, um, legislation, legislature is in full force and um, there are two things, you know, one we talked about tonight, earn sick and safe leave and whether or not that's going to show up at the state level this year. But also, um, I, I don't know where we stand on the local control thing that's being pushed through around housing. And I know that was on our legislative priorities list, um, but I don't know, like, do either can we get an update on how that's going or do we as council members need to be advocating on our own to be, um, you know, pushing our our point of view there. I just would be love to have that conversation. Uh, Mr. Verbrugge, we're now that we're into the session here, and I remember during the last session we had uh, Mr. Rudlang on a regular basis give us legislative updates. We might want to get that back on the agendas for our council meetings. Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Delisandro, that's a, a good question and a good suggestion about having a regular update. Uh, I did see an update from the Metro Cities organization that um, the the bill that was being advanced by Representative Elkins, which has to do, uh, that's the one that's getting the most attention regarding the local control and the housing issues. Uh, that, that first hearing happened last week and um, it, it actually went uh, long so that there was very little testimony on it and uh, they're going to come back. I'm not sure of the subsequent uh, meeting date that they have for that. So uh, that one obviously is generating a lot of uh, discussion and interest uh, both by cities and uh, housing, uh, uh, housing advocates, uh, Housing First Minnesota. You know, there are a lot of interested parties so we can get you a, a summary of where we're at on that. And, and I think it is a good idea just to do a touch base on where we're at and other legislation. And we do have uh, the Bloomington sales tax uh, will be uh, making its way through the process here in the next couple of weeks as well. So there, there's timely updates that will be coming here in the next couple of weeks. All right. Uh, the final thing that I will add, uh, and as I, th I think you all know, and at least I think I've talked to most of you about it one way or another, I uh, had a very educational trip to the World Expo in Dubai over the past week. Uh, it was, it, as I said, it was it was very educational too, to understand a little bit better what the World Expo is, what the goals are, how it all works, how it's all put together. Uh, rather than try and fill the time tonight, uh, it, it will be the main topic in the, the council minute on Wednesday, so I'd encourage you to watch, and we'll I'll be able to provide some good details and good messaging on it, a lot of good uh, video and a lot of good images to manage to get a lot of that, and you get a better understanding. And uh, I think as we continue to to move down this path, uh, Mr. Verbrugge, we we should probably find a time for uh, our Expo Minnesota folks to come in and, and discuss this with the council, at least give an update. I think to keep everybody updated and keep uh, keep them uh, knowledgeable as to where we are in the whole process. Mr. Mayor and council members, I believe that's an excellent idea as well. We do have a couple additional meetings this week as the process continues to unfold here. And uh, 
I think providing opportunities to discuss this at a public level is a good thing going forward, just so the uh, whether it's the residents of Bloomington or the state of Minnesota that um, have a vested interest in understanding what this is and what it means for the future of the state and the community uh, can understand it better. It's a good idea. Yep, I think so. I think so. Council, anything else for the good of the community this evening? If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn this evening's meeting. Hearing no further discussion, Mr. Billard. Carter. Aye. Coulter. Aye. D'Alessandro. Aye. Lohman. Aye. Martin. Aye. Nelson. Aye. Mayor Bussey. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. We are adjourned. Thank you much for tuning in. Thank you much uh, to the staff and everybody who helped out tonight. Thank you all for the discussion. Good conversation tonight. Thanks much. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.